Um, will the clerk please call the meeting to order? Chair Du Bois. Here. Council Member Philsef. Here. Vice Mayor Koo. Yeah, here. All present. Thank you. All right. Thank you. First item is oral communications to speak to any item not on the agenda tonight. Um, so if any members of the public would like to speak, please raise your hand. Oh, we do have some raised hands. One moment, please. Yeah, see two speakers. Our first speaker is Brooke. Yep. So Brooke Partridge, go ahead. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, yes, my name is Brooke Partridge, and I have lived in downtown Palo Alto for nearly 30 years, the last 20 of which have been at 101 Alma in the tower building near the corner of Alma and El Camino. Um, I am here to present a community request to create a quiet zone at the Alma El Camino train crossing. Um, it is with great authority with the many years that I have lived here that I can say that the train horn negatively impacts the quality of life of many residents throughout the downtown North and Linfield Oaks communities in both Palo Alto and Menlo Park. For some citizens, train horn noise interrupts their sleep and for others it interferes with activities requiring focus. This impact is felt, you can hear it right now going by, this impact is felt by people of all ages. Um, research has linked poor sleep quality to poor health outcomes, including obesity, hypertension, coronary artery disease, inflammation, depression, even suicidality. Anecdotally, I can share that on many occasions, my seven-year-old twins wake around midnight from the train horns. And in this world of Zoom meetings and working from home, my virtual colleagues are as familiar with the train horn out my window as I am. I can't have a productive work call without regularly employing the mute button and leaving windows closed. The disruption from train horns occurs every day. Every weekday, 104 trains pass through the station between the hours of 5 a.m. and 1 a.m. During peak commute hours, it's every 10 to 15 minutes. The official decibel level of the train horn ranges from 96 to 110 decibels. For comparison, that's almost as loud as a jet aircraft at 500 feet and several decibels louder than emergency sirens at 50 feet. So imagine emergency vehicles passing through your neighborhood with sirens blaring 104 times per day. However, the train horn is actually unnecessary. The intersection already meets many, possibly all of the qualifications to be a quiet zone. There is a, a gate with a median at the Alma El Camino intersection. When trains approach, the gates go down, the lights turn on. And while safety is of course our main concern, it's also helpful to note that according to the FRA's train horn rules, the city is not liable for any accidents that do occur to the, due to the enforcement of a quiet zone. Our team at 101 Alma created a petition for this proposal and with little effort received 209 signatures so far. We believe we could get that significantly more if helpful to the cause because of the significant detriment to quality of life and the ability to meet and, and exist coexisting with the ability to meet safety standards. We propose creating this quiet zone at the intersection. This has been done in countless other communities throughout the US as well. We seek council support by June 1st for the 2023 fiscal year. This process will be greatly simplified due to the possibility of piggybacking on Menlo Park's quiet zone project. I'll be done in just a second. Menlo Park is currently hiring a consultant to analyze the eligibility of their three train intersections for quiet zones. Also, there was a study done by Palo Alto in 2017 about the eligibility of the Alma Street intersection as a quiet zone. Thank you for your time. We look forward to hearing from you on this matter, uh, perhaps in a future meeting. Um, and if there are any questions, um, please uh, feel free to reach out. We will certainly be reaching out again as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg. Thank you so much. I, um, I will discuss the constitutional and logical issues with the proposed business tax later because that's on the agenda, right? Right. Okay. So what I want to discuss is... Um, it's something that I'm really hoping that you all will um, research yourselves and confirm. 
um, like I said at the last meeting with regard to affordable housing and building housing in Palo Alto, um, what the mayor and other council people seem to be so excited about putting housing at Stanford Research Park currently is against the law according to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency's website available to you at epa.gov. If on that website you research the HP Hewlett Packard Superfund site, you will see that the current status of the HP Superfund site is that residential uses are currently prohibited. You'll also say that use of the ground see that use of the groundwater is prohibited. So it's logical to assume that the reason that no housing exists there is because of the EPA's current, as of its own website, stance that it is illegal, it is against federal and I assume California law to use that space for residential uses. I think this is an extremely important matter to consider because I agree with the sentiment that we need available to us all the land in Palo Alto as possible in order to place housing where in places where it makes sense near jobs. That said, we cannot put housing, especially housing for the most vulnerable, for those people who qualify for subsidized housing, it isn't acceptable for us to place that housing on toxic waste dumps. It's not, apart from it being illegal, it's immoral. And really all I'm asking is that you go to the EPA's website that you just look up HP Superfund site and that you see for yourself what is the current status. I hope you do pursue this and you do require HP and Stanford to clean this up. We deserve a toxic-free Palo Alto. Thank you for considering. Our uh, last speaker tonight is Aaron James. Okay, so I'm going to read something that uh, just a part of something I wrote on March 26, 2022. Uh, one of Robert Johnson's opponents for sheriff, Sergeant Christina Gay, announced today in an article in the Daily Post that the first thing she will do if elected sheriff will be to end radio trans uh, encryption. Like Robert uh, Johnson. She can spell the word transparency and actually believes in the concept. On April 4th, the Palo Alto Police Department is having a study session, a one-sided, shouldn't be called a study session because it's not. It's a one-sided propaganda session where the PAPD uh, with a city manager uh, and the city attorney will try to jam down our throats that radio encryption is the only way to go. Well, we know for one thing, Josh Becker, state assemblyman, has penny legislation to uh, enforce uh, re-encrypting radio transmission across the state. And we also know that the CHP has an alternative to that. And you know, these study sessions, they always call uh, the city, the, the, the city's viewpoint only exclusively. It's not de a democratic process. There's no cross-examination. And if even if the city council members get to cross-examine uh, the city, it's just the city. So why not invite Dave Price or Diana Dimer or other knowledgeable people in the press and in the public regarding alternatives, viable alternatives to radio encryption? Uh, and why, you know, otherwise it's simply a dog and pony show. It just creates a, a continued lack of trust in the Palo Alto to Police Department. Now, I'm told by somebody that if you watch co closely tonight, the city manager or, and I don't know if this is true, or city manager substitute will use the word, you know, frankly or honestly, and whatever comes out of their mouth after the frankly or the honestly uh, will actually be just the opposite, okay? So just, just check that. I've seen over the years that our city managers are often cut out of the same mold, the, you know, the same managed conversation. 
So I'm just going to read it. This is from February 211, 205. Uh, and a crucial part of the job of a city council member is listening to members of the public who come uh, to meetings to speak, even if they have things to say that the council members don't want to hear. Yet Palo Alto mayor, and I'm leaving that blank, ordered a speaker to stop talking during the public comment portion of Monday City Council meeting. And when the speaker wouldn't stop, the mayor recessed the meeting and uniformed police officers arrived. No arrests were made. Uh, this episode began when Aram James, a critic of the police department, got up to address the council and complain about the way city manager Frank Bennist ran a council meeting uh, or a retreat a week earlier. Bennis managed retreat so that the police oversight would not even be on the list. Again, you're letting the city manager run the show. Please, please make that April 4th hearing, bring in alternatives to the city's position on encryption, make it a real thing before uh, this, the city rebels even further. Thank you so much. Apologize for going over time. All right, thank you. And that ends our public comment. <clears throat> so we have one item on the agenda tonight, which is really uh, to discuss our 2022 ballot measures. And um, so we have a staff presentation on this. We do. Thank you, Chair Du Bois. Um, good. Uh, yep, it's evening. Good evening, Kylie Jose, Administrative Services Director. Um, and I'm actually here representing the team, which uh, are actually dealing with some colds. So I will be presenting and the staff liaison for tonight um, in lieu of Christine Frost, who's been leading you through this effort. Um, with that, I will we'll have the city clerk share the PowerPoint. All right, and then next slide, please. Okay, uh, one more, please. All right, as the chair just alluded to tonight, we're here to basically continue our work on potential 2022 ballot measures for the council's consideration. Um, we have a team of individuals here, although uh, myself, obviously from a staff perspective, but we also have our consultants here. We have Dave Metz from FM3, who will present polling results. We have Sean Spano um, from Public Dialogue Consortium, um, as well as Ben Fay, who is our outside legal counsel as well. So amongst the team here in person, as well as our virtual team of consultants, uh, we're hoping to work through tonight updates since our January 2022 discussion with the city council. Um, since that last meeting, the Two months ago about, um, staff have implemented and run full force into the community and stakeholder engagement plan. A new website was launched, stakeholder engagement through existing communications, such as our business newsletter, as well as Uplift Local. Um, invitations were sent out to community groups and business group leaders to participate in focus groups. Um, a mailer survey was issued citywide, as well as an online survey. Um, and we continue, frankly, to receive responses to this day. Uh, we'll provide an update on those in the presentation tonight. Uh, we've also started working with our legal counsel on the ballot language for the question, as well as the measures themselves. So tonight you'll see us kind of walk through our progress, um, areas for the Finance Committee's review and recommendation to City Council, um, and us following up on some items that the council had asked for. So on the next slide, this is just a reminder of the last direction that city council provided staff. As you can see, um, items B, C, and D are all slated to either have been completed or are slated for council approval on April 4th. I, that's item C, the contract with FM3. And tonight we're here to talk about item A, which is continuing to refine the potential ballot measures. Next slide, please. This is a high level look again at just the work plan between now and June, which the council as part of that work plan would be the final date for the council's consideration and ultimately um, final approval of any potential um, measures to be placed before the voters in November, 2022. We're here in March and are scheduled to go review what we're reviewing with you finance committee this March in April with the full city council. May, we'll take that council direction and then also return back to full council in June for that final vote. Next slide, please. So ultimately, tonight we are here looking at these components that are outlined on the slide. I won't read through all of them. And what we're looking for is uh, recommendations from the kitty, from the council, sorry, from the council. No, 
switch that. We're looking for recommendations from the committee to the council for ultimately the council's consideration of these recommendations on April 18th as an action item. So we've got, as I mentioned, our second round of polling results, a progress report on stakeholder engagement, a draft ballot question and language for your review and feedback associated with the gas general fund transfer measure, and finalizing those core characteristics of a square footage business tax. All right, next slide, please. And one more. So now we're gonna go through our community engagement. So uh, first I'll kick us off and then I'll turn it over to Dave Metz. Um, right here, you can actually see these are, uh, as of last, I think Thursday, all of the mail-in ballot uh, responses, not ballots, I'm sorry, mail-in surveys that our community has filled out um, and our staff has tracked and articulated the rank priorities based on that feedback. There was also an online version of this same survey. And in total, we have 360 responses and climbing. So what's represented in your packet today discusses high rank priorities for spend, maintaining basic services, streets and roads, investing in community owned assets, um, our public safety services, as well as affordable housing and homelessness investments. All right, and with that, I will turn it over to Dave Metz, who will present the results of the second poll. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Nose. Uh, members of the committee, I'm Dave Metz with FM3 Research, and I'm pleased to present the results of our second survey for your consideration in evaluating potential ballot measures for this November's election. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, You'll remember earlier in the year, we presented you with the results of an initial baseline survey and then took direction from the council about some areas that they'd like to see explored in greater depth in future survey research. These included revised descriptions for the potential business license tax measure and utility fund transfer measure, um, discussion of different tax rates and exemptions that might be made part of a business license tax, further exploration of the interaction of these two measures if they were on the same ballot together, and a range of different pro and con arguments that might be part of a community conversation around a business license tax. Uh, this survey, the second in what is anticipated to be a series of three surveys that we'll conduct for the city, uh, explored those issues. Um, with the findings of this survey and the other work that, that you and the council will do, um, the plan is to conduct a third and final survey, which will test a much more defined ballot measure concept, including draft ballot language, um, for a final test of viability with the public before you make a determination about whether to place one or both measures on the ballot. The methodology of this survey, very similar to the past uh, survey with a slightly smaller sample size, given that we had a narrower focus here. We spoke with 427 voters citywide who are considered likely to cast ballots in this November's election. As previously, the interviews were done on landline phones, wireless phones, and online with both email and text message invitations used to drive respondents to the survey. Uh, with that, a little bit about what we learned. We started with some uh, sort of broad questions, as you'll see on the next slide about potential ballot measure concepts. Um, the first was a description of the uh, business license tax concept as refined uh, based on your direction, a tax of $50 per year for the first 5,000 square feet plus 12 cents per square foot per month for space occupied over that amount with a brief summary of the places that the money from such a measure might go. Um, this is not formal ballot language, but it does include the key elements that would go into a measure that most voters would see on the ballot in such a description. For half our sample, we asked this concept first before we introduced the ballot measure that would deal with transfers from the city's utility fund. For the other half of the sample, we asked it second with the utility fund presented first. You'll see at the bottom of the slide, the results for uh, both sequences in which this ballot measure concept appeared. The difference between them is right around the survey's margin of error given the split sample. Um, and we see about three in five voters indicating they would vote yes, uh, with roughly one third of voters indicating that they would vote no. This is comparable to the level of support we have seen for similar, although not exactly the same concepts described in previous survey research. On the next slide, you'll see the description we tested for the utility fund. This is a 
slightly simplified uh, version of what this transfer would entail. Um, we refined the language based on what we tested in the previous survey. Again, this is a little bit more of a plain English conceptual explanation of what is still a rather technical and difficult concept, um, but uh, different than the ballot language that voters would ultimately see. Uh, but again, we asked voters whether they'd be inclined to vote yes or no, presented it for half the sample before the business license tax and for half the sample afterwards. And as you'll see here, um, while to start out with, uh, voters who heard this concept were a little bit more tentative about it, offering a slightly lower level of support and a far less definite level of support. In both cases, more than two thirds of those polled indicated that they would vote yes. Uh, and that is also consistent with what we have seen in prior surveys. Um, you'll see some examples of the interaction between these measures on the next slide. Um, and uh, there's a sizable group of voters who uh, would vote yes on both measures. As you'll see here among those who said they'd vote yes on the business license tax, 82% said they would vote yes on the uh, utility measure. Among those who would oppose a business license tax, a majority would vote yes on the utility measure. And among undecideds, again, a majority said they would vote yes. So that reflects the fact that there's broader support for the utility fund measure than there was for the uh, business license tax. We also gave people a little bit more explanation about the history behind these utility fund transfers, as you'll see on the next slide. Uh, we consider this information that would be unlikely to appear in a ballot question, um, but still is the kind of information that the city could communicate to explain why it would put a measure like this on the ballot and the history of these fund transfers in the past. Um, and so we wanted to understand whether an understanding of that history changed the way that voters viewed this potential ballot measure. Um, as well as the fact that uh, the city's role as, as having a municipal utility makes it different than many surrounding communities where there are investor-owned utilities that are providing those same services. As you'll see on the next slide, this explanation did not uh, yield a significant shift in overall responses. 71% um, merging together the, the sequence in which the uh, measure was presented for the two halves of our sample initially said they would vote yes. After this explanation, the numbers uh, were at 69%. A couple of points lower, but with a slightly higher definite yes, statistically identical. So uh, voters seem willing to support this concept even without hearing that more detailed background. Finally, after all our respondents had heard descriptions of both measures, we came back with a more focused question, asking the respondents to consider that both measures might be on the same ballot and indicate whether they thought they would vote yes on both yes on just one of the two measures or uh, vote for neither of them. Uh, this is a very tough question to ask because we are kind of prompting voters to think about the two measures in a comparative sense and sort of consider whether they want to vote for both. Uh, in reality, they'll just see both measures on the ballot with nothing prompting them to connect one to the other. Um, and our experience is that this question tends to make voters a little bit more tentative to support measures when they're presented this way. But even given that more conservative framing of the question, we still have half of those polled who indicate that they would vote for the business license tax and 58% for the utility fund measure. Um, we're, we'll need the sort of the final survey to make a, a final definitive recommendation on feasibility. Uh, but this survey, like the previous one, seems to suggest that support for both measures in concept is high enough that they could move to the ballot together and ultimately be successful. And we also had some follow-up questions, as you'll see starting on the next slide, that asked respondents to think about different ways a business license tax might be structured. And one of the things that uh, we were asked about in the uh, prior uh, meeting of the council was to test a range of different rates um, for that square footage component of the uh, business license tax. Um, and so we gave people a variety of different incremental monthly taxes that businesses might be asked to pay. You may remember the base case we tested up front was 12 cents per month, but we also gave our respondents a range of average monthly rents per square foot that local businesses currently pay between $4 and 10 cents and $6 and 40 cents per square foot. In that context, we asked them whether increases of various proportions would be acceptable or unacceptable. 
We rotated the order in which they were presented. For half, we started low and then went high. For the other half, we started high and then went low. <clears throat> and you'll see the results here. We have solid majority support for an increase up to 10 cents. Um, voters are split on a 15 cent amount. And obviously the 12 cent base case we tested falls in between those two. Likely at least plurality, if not uh, majority support, but not by a, a wide margin. Um, and a majority rejects the idea of a 20 cent per month uh, per square foot uh, tax increase. We also asked about reactions to a variety of exemptions that might be included in the measure, which might uh, uh, mean that certain types of businesses would not have to uh, pay the tax, as you'll see on the next slide, and ask respondents if they would be more likely or less likely to support the measure if various types of businesses were exempted. Um, a majority of 54% said they'd be more likely to uh, uh, vote for a measure that exempted all businesses with a footprint under 5,000 square feet. That is um, almost four times as many as said they would be less likely to vote for a measure with that exemption. Um, by almost three to one, voters say they'd be more likely to vote for a measure that exempts grocery stores. Uh, retail stores, they're close to evenly divided with about two and five saying it wouldn't make a difference to them. Uh, and there was more negative sentiment than positive sentiment for the idea of exempting hotels. Um, and again, obviously there's a lot of detail and background that could be provided for the context of each of these types of businesses. Uh, this question is really just trying to understand voters' gut reactions to the idea uh, of exempting each of these classes. So aside from how the revenue might be collected and in what amounts, we also wanted to explore how the money might be spent if the city uh, did uh, move forward with a tax of this type. And we asked our respondents, as you'll see on the next slide, whether they would like to see the money from such a measure allocated in one of two ways. Uh, as you'll see on the left-hand slide, it's slide in the dark green. One option was offering major new city services focused on housing, climate change, rail crossing, uh, transportation or, or support for the unhoused, or on the right-hand side, improving the quality and reliability of existing core services like fire, emergency services, parks, and recreation. Overall, plurality of voters, given that choice, favored offering new city services by a margin of 49 to 39. But you'll note that there are some differences within different subgroups of the Palo Alto electorate. Um, Democrats favor new services, as do women, younger voters, um, and those most likely to vote for a business license tax, whereas other subgroups tend to favor the improving the quality and reliability of core services, including independents, Republicans, men, um, and those who are likely to vote no on the business license tax. And a more granular question that followed on the next slide, we offered the respondents a list of more specific ways that money from the measure could be allocated and asked them to rate each one as uh, um, either extremely, very, somewhat, or not too important. And running down the right-hand side, uh, you'll see the total that rated each as either extremely or very important, the top two points on that scale. So the things that are, that are at the top of the list here tend to focus on either uh, public safety or on housing, um, improving police response to violent crime, uh, improving the speed and reliability of ambulance service, police response to property crimes, uh, safety for pedestrians, bicyclists, and drivers uh, with uh, separated uh, uh, grade crossings. Um, and then we also see the exp expanding outreach to people experiencing homelessness and funding affordable housing. As you'll recall from the survey we conducted earlier this year, uh, the uh, issues relating to housing costs and homelessness are among local voters' top concerns, as is climate change, which you'll see at the bottom of the slide. A majority view it is very important to allocate funding toward uh, advancing the city's climate action plan. On the next slide, you'll see the lower tier of spending priorities. And I say lower as a, as a relative measurement. Um, if you add up the dark green, medium green, and light green bars here, the first three, that's the proportion that rate each of these items at least somewhat important. And in each case, that's uh, roughly two thirds or more. Uh, the red bars with the proportion dismissing any of these items as unimportant never exceeds more than about one quarter of the electorate. So these are all things that voters would like to see investment in. They just don't rank as being quite as urgent. Um, and that includes parks and recreation, uh, traffic and transportation, animal sheltering and care, and library services. 
Um, and you may remember in the survey earlier this year, we saw that concern about traffic had decreased dramatically over the last couple of years, as it has in much of the Bay Area, given uh, different travel patterns during the pandemic, um, and also fairly broad satisfaction with existing library services. So in relative terms, these things rank a little bit lower as uh, investment priorities. The final section of the poll offered voters of a potential business license tax measure might say, asked them to rate each one as either uh, very somewhat or not convincing as a reason to either support or oppose the measure. These are the arguments in favor, and you'll see they fall into three tiers. Um, the strongest argument says that uh, changing the business license tax would be more equitable, um, would require uh, large businesses to uh, pay more to support city services. Um, the second tier includes the, um, uh, a message citing the comparison of neighboring communities in terms of what they require and uh, clarifying that the city's tax base is at risk given declining sales tax revenue and the need for um, other supports to address future financial needs. And then the two least compelling messages with fewer than 30% rating them very convincing focused on accountability provisions and uh, impacts on public safety funding uh, during the pandemic. On the other side of the equation, as you'll see on the next slide, we tested a range of opposition arguments. The four that we tested here all polled in roughly the same range in the low to, to mid thirties, rating them either, uh, rating them very convincing reasons to oppose the measure. Um, the argument that it would end up impacting small and medium businesses more because large businesses would find a way to avoid paying the tax, um, arguing that with inflation on the rise, now is not the time to raise taxes. Um, speaking about the strain that local businesses have already faced because of the pandemic and questioning whether city government can be trusted to spend money from the measure efficiently. Um, I hasten to add these messages are in no way unique to Palo Alto. These are the same messages we test for revenue measures in just about any uh, local government uh, here in the Bay Area, and the, the same areas of concern pop up uh, regardless of which community we're testing them in. So you'll see the impact of these messages on the next slide. Uh, we rotated the order in which they were presented. Half heard the opposition arguments first, half heard the arguments in favor first, and we retested support for the same business license tax concept after voters heard each set of messages. So we have that initial support I described to you earlier, 61% in favor, 31% opposed. Uh, for the half sample that heard the positive arguments first in isolation, it moved support up to 69%. For the other half of the sample, which heard the negative arguments first in isolation, it drove support down to 54%. And then finally, uh, you'll see where voters landed after hearing arguments on both sides, regardless of the order in which they were presented, 60% in favor, 31% opposed, uh, a level of support virtually identical to where it was before the messaging was tested. This repeats a pattern that we saw in the prior polling where we have a pretty durable majority that indicates support for a business license tax, although a somewhat tentative majority with always less than one third indicating they would definitely vote yes. Um, uh, and again, we haven't spelled out the sort of a full and detailed proposal the way that we ultimately may if, if the council provides direction about what type of measure it would like to move forward with. Um, and we might anticipate that with more details filled in, we see a slightly more uh, definite response from the voting public globally. So that takes us to the conclusions, um, which you will see on the next slide here. Uh, again, uh, we see a pretty consistent support from about three and five for the business license uh, tax concept comfort with uh, an average monthly uh, tax of about 10 cents per square foot, uh, potentially slightly higher. It's there's sort of a gray area between 10 and 15 cents. Um, strong support for the utility fund with uh, the more voters understand it, the more confidence they tend to have in voting yes. Um, and uh, a willingness to vote for both measures together on the same ballot, although certainly some uncertainty as, as voters confront that possibility. Um, and then finally, in the last couple of bullet points, again, just recapping the uh, areas that voters would most like to see additional tax revenues invested. So that's a summary uh, of the po key poll findings this time around. Uh, I'll hand it back to Ms. Nose. I can either take questions or we can hold them. I don't know if we want to move on with the, the rest of the presentation. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I might recommend we just finish the presentation. We have the stakeholder engagement next. Okay, so on the next slide, I'll turn it over to Mr. Spano from the Public Dialogue Consortium to go over Kylie, the... would you mind speaking closer to your mic? Oh, sorry. I think we're all having trouble hearing you. Thanks. Yep. Um, I will turn it over to Mr. Spano to go over the stakeholder engagement. Very good. Uh, thank you, Assistant Manager Nose, Sean Spano, uh, here to report on the uh, focus groups and community engagement. Um, it's good to be back with you, Finance Committee. So uh, this was a slide that uh, I presented when we were talking about the stakeholder engagement plan when I was last meeting with you. And so this is just a refresh. Uh, the objectives of the community engagement portion of the project are to design and execute a multidisciplinary engagement and communication process to support the project. We uh, endorse and embrace and, Im and implement a multidisciplinary approach, and I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, that first bullet there is our, our work in uh, par uh, parallel with what you just heard from uh, Mr. Metz and the FM3 research and the public opinion poll. We work on parallel paths. And then uh, you heard um, uh, Ms. Nose mention many of the outreach efforts that have been uh, implemented already, including that online survey, mail-in and online survey on service priorities, and then several other um, approaches to engage the community, including the focus groups, which will be my focus tonight. And at, uh, uh, once we work through all of the community engagement activities, we will provide information, updates, and recommendations uh, to you, the Finance Committee, obviously to city staff, and then to council, ultimately uh, uh, to council. Uh, next slide, please. Getting specific into the focus groups. We uh, staff in particular engage in a very extensive outreach uh, activities to invite uh, your community members to the focus groups. This was done via mail and regular mail to Palo Alto businesses and community organizations. You have a copy of the outreach efforts and invite text as part of the staff report. We were able to conduct five focus groups. You'll see the dates there from February into the middle of March. Four of those focus groups were specifically targeted to the business community, business community stakeholders. There were 27 participants targeted specifically to community at large, and uh, that had six participants. You have a list of all the participants as an atta in attachment D in your staff report. Let me just mention a couple here. On the business community stakeholders, there was a diverse range of businesses that were represented. Chamber of Commerce, small retail and restaurants, um, hotels, major employers uh, in the city, uh, Stanford Research Park, Stanford University, and the businesses associated with the Stanford Shopping Center. Uh, real estate companies were represented in law, law firms, as well as uh, senior housing. And in the one community focus group, it was populated primarily with uh, representatives from the nonprofit sector, have, um, providing housing services and youth services. And again, you have the full list of participants in your, uh, in your staff report. And in terms of participation, any member of the community who expressed any interest in participating was accommodated. We were able to um, uh, invite them and have them in the focus group. In fact, three of the focus groups were canceled and two were rescheduled due to low attendance. So the, um, the interest in participating in the focus groups was uh, okay, but a little on the underwhelming side. Uh, results were great. Um, participation um, uh, was a little on the, as I mentioned, a little on the low side. Uh, moving forward, we can get into the uh, purposes of the focus groups. Uh, next slide, please. So there were three purposes. One was to educate stakeholders about the city's fiscal sustainability strategy and the two funding options currently under consideration. This took the form of a relatively brief staff presentation. We use that to kick off the focus groups. 
And then we opened it up for feedback, which was the primary focus. And we were asking feedback about city service priorities that are important to the business and uh, community at large. And then also eliciting feedback, of course, on the two ballot measures. And we asked both about the gas funds transfer as well as the business license tax. As uh, next slide, please, we'll move into the results. And you'll see that these results mirror what you just heard from Mr. Metz on the public opinion poll. And again, what we're doing in the focus groups is we're, we're able to get a little bit more depth in terms of the reasoning, the uh, thinking perspectives and views that people are bringing to their preferences for the business license tax or the gas funds transfer. And so there's a little bit of depth here that we were able to capture in the focus groups. But if we dial this up and look at it from a higher level, we can see that the results really do echo very nicely what you heard in the public opinion poll. In terms of the support for the gas funds transfer, we heard a lot of people in the focus groups say that they supported this or they were neutral. They didn't really have a strong opinion and mostly because they weren't familiar with it. We heard little or no opposition to the gas funds transfer in, in, the, in the five focus groups. Moving on to support for the business license tax, there was some conditional support for the business license tax. And I'll talk about that in just a moment when we look at the, uh, the major themes that, were, that emerged. What was the support conditioned on? And I also um, uh, want to report that there was uh, also several members of the focus groups who were very clear and direct in saying that they would not support the business license tax under any condition. And again, you'll see that, that mirroring that 35% or so that were that um, of no votes, no preference in the public opinion poll. So let's move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about what those major themes are as they were related to the business license tax. And this had to do with uh, uh, the themes that emerged. And so what we were doing when we analyzed the focus group results are looking for themes and patterns and trends that cut across the focus groups. There were a lot of one-off comments that didn't make it into one of these four categories, but we feel very confident that these four categories capture the, the, the main thrust of what we heard in the focus groups. So one concern that we heard was no cap on the CPI. And the concern, of course, is that the tax will continually increase, to paraphrase one of the part, uh, focus group participants, will continually increase until a business is having to pay, especially a large business is having to pay upwards of millions of dollars. The suggestions from the focus group participants was to put a cap on the CPI. And then that led some other focus group participants to offer a related suggestion. Perhaps the city could cap the total amount that a business would pay. The second concern was no sunset. And so the, the no cap on the CPI and the no sunset work hand in hand together. Given that there's no CPI cap and no sunset date, the concern is that the, the tax will increase gradually increase indefinitely. And you put those two together and that was the main area of concern that we heard in the focus groups. So along with the suggestion to either cap the CPI or cap the total amount that a business would pay comes the suggestion to designate a, a specified end date. Uh, in discussions with staff, it uh, is also possible of course, that you could suspend the business license tax given certain economic conditions that uh, are in play at a particular time. We also heard that this is not the right time. And you heard some of that from uh, Mr. Metz on the notion of uh, COVID recovery, the current state of inflation, the uncertainty around the economic condition given recovery from COVID, given the economic climate, given the um, uh, the situation with, uh, with, with uh, inflation and that the timing issue was another major concern and they see that as being a disincentive to attract new businesses and a potential to take businesses that are currently operating and not enabling them to go forward that they would have to go out of business. So the suggestion is 
uh, to postpone placing the tax on the ballot. This is just not the right time. That's the, the gist of that concern there. And then we also heard um, on the public opinion poll about linking the business license tax revenue to particular services. And so the, the concern that we heard was that the re how the revenue will be allocated, particularly to the general fund, and what the, the participants in the focus groups uh, were suggesting was specifying how the revenue will be allocated to benefit the business community and the community at large. And this was a little bit different from the public opinion poll. The uh, participants were not advocating to link the revenue from the business license tax to new services. It was to link the revenue to existing services that benefit the business community. Public safety was identified, affordable housing was identified, and, the per and um, enhancing your permitting and development services, staffing and service delivery were the main uh, services that were identified here. I believe that takes us through, oh, we have one more slide on next steps. Next slide, please. So we are um, uh, having a listening session that will be tomorrow evening. And as part of that listening session, we will be asking some of the same questions we asked in the focus groups. And then depending on the direction that staff receives and, and we, the consultants receive, from you, the finance committee tonight, we will put that in front of the, uh, the participants in the listening session tomorrow evening to give them something to respond to specifically in terms of some of the structure and decisions. That we will be making. There will also be a second round of focus groups in the April, uh, early May timeframe, and that will be to elicit more targeted feedback. Clearly, we were, the, the questions in the focus group were fairly wide and open-ended given that um, uh, the finance committee and council and larger council, of course, are considering the particular structures and particulars. As we get those uh, structures and particulars, we'll be able to ask the community about those in that second round of focus groups. And then of course, we will be updating uh, you, the finance committee and city council with those new results that we uh, acquire in the April to May uh, timeframe, as well as the listening session tomorrow evening. So that concludes uh, my presentation and I'll turn it back over to um, um, Assistant City Manager Nose. All right, um, thank you both Dave and Sean. Uh, really quickly, I'll go through the next two sections. Um, as we move closer to June, we wanted to begin to look at the formal steps and documents um, that should the council choose to vote or vote to place a measure on the ballot. Um, what are the documents that would be brought forward? What would be the council reviewing between now and then and ultimately approving? So first for an official ballot measure on this next slide, um, there's a letter of designation generated by the county registrars of voters. Uh, the council um, would be re reviewing and approving a ballot question. We'll go over that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. And then obviously there will be a space for voters to mark um, in favor or not. In advance of the election itself, a voter will receive a voter information guide and that's gonna have impartial analysis. It'll have the full text of the measure, something else staff is working on and then arguments for or against. So in this packet, we've started to provide examples of what those look like in association with the gas funds transfer affirmation. So on this slide, you can see this is an initial draft of a ballot question. Um, there is obviously the percentage, the rate that's left empty, and ultimately um, the uses. Uh, we could round out additional information in there. So a ballot question can only be 75 words. The question or the draft question that's before you on this slide is about 60 words. So as you can imagine, as we move through the final round of polling and in work with both the committee and the council, we will be rounding out those final 15 or so words that could be placed as part of the ballot question itself. We would do something similar like this for a business license tax, obviously with different um, rates and structures. So one, no decision needs to be made on this as of tonight. However, feedback on this draft question, as well as there's the full text of the measure in the packet in attachment E. 
Um, these are the types of documents that staff are working on. Obviously, these are the gas funds one. And then if the council chose to do a business license tax, we would do those same documents for that measure as well. So just wanted to highlight these um, as we're embarking and moving closer to that June timeframe. Uh, on the next slide, we are just, this talks about the various um, definitions and the work associated with crafting those two documents um, for the business license tax. And of particular note, one of the things that came up as part of our focus groups, as well as working with our um, team and our legal counsel, uh, we were really, one of the things we're trying to figure out is the appropriate definition for a grocery store or supermarket. Um, that came up as feedback during the focus groups, as it can be a very broad range. <laughs> All right, business tax analysis. The council directed staff to adjust the business license analysis on the next slide. Um, option three was the preferred choice by the council. Um, as you may recall, this meant that for the first 5,000 square feet, that there would be a, a flat um, tax or fee um, that would be assessed. And for the 5,001 square footage, the rate would start to um, come into effect. So uh, council asked staff to model this again with grocery stores and hotels exempt. So what's on the slide before you in the green is that new modeling. It's got an estimated gross revenue of 11 to 43 million, depending on the rate at which the council chose to do. And then on the right, this notes the um, calculation adjustments that staff did to get there. So this shows about 38 properties being exempted. Uh, about eight of those are grocery and about 30 of those are under hospitality. So the information that staff generated this based on is CoStar um, data, since we don't necessarily have all of the data ourselves. And so we did look at the grocery definition under CoStar and hospitality definition under CoStar. And that's the most granular the data gets. Overall, when you exempt those two categories, it's about an 8% reduction from the original range. As a reminder, the second round of polling reflected majority support for a tax rate of up to 1.5%. That's approximately 10 cents per square foot per month. Um, and then exemptions for businesses less than 5,000 square feet is um, one of the tenants that would likely gain um, more support. On the next slide, A little bit more detail, um, modeling what the rough um, cost per month would be with those exemptions. Um, you can see in that table under number two, as I mentioned before, this assumes that on the square footage 5,001 is when these rates would kick in. And then on the far right are ultimately the characteristics that staff and hopefully with the committee's help will look at refining and provide recommendations to council um, for their consideration in April. So, Things like exemption of those first 5,000 square feet, uh, what one might deem as the small, um, for example, exemption of grocery stores, exemptions of hotels, the CIP, as well as uh, one of the points came up previously on wanting to deal with the business registry certificate program and the tax. And after working internally, staff's brought forward as part of your packet, recommending that we run the BRC concurrent with the tax. So ultimately the tax would say that the first 5,000 square feet of any business is exempt. Concurrent with the tax, we would continue to run the BRC with the $50 flat fee for the administration of the business registry certificate program. So that's how we would merge or rather um, operate these two programs in the future should the council choose to place a business tax on the measure or on the ballot and the voters approve it. And then lastly, another way to look at what I just said is um, these are the major components for the business tax ballot measure and the council has provided the bulk of the um, direction needed under structure exemptions are the final piece of that puzzle and really tonight we're focusing on hopefully with the guidance of the polling as well as the stakeholder engagement, the more specifics and nailing down the revenue and modeling aspect of this so what's the right rate what are the right um, structures etc. And once we figured out those, we'll move into the final piece, which is administration. So how are we going to administer it? What's the um, internally working on the ballot questions, working on the actual measure language itself? Um, 
The next slide is actually just your motion. And I'm remiss to say we forgot to put in a next steps. So just as a high level for the committee and frankly, the public's awareness. Um, our discussion tonight is all in preparation for bringing the finance committee's recommendation to the full council on um, in April. April 18th is the current tentative date. Concurrent with that, the staff will continue our stakeholder engagement. As Mr. Spano said, we have a listening session tomorrow night that everybody is invited to participate in. We will also in May, or sorry, in that April date, um, review and uh, seek direction to complete that third poll. That third poll is slated to be done in May of this year with ultimately the final council approval in June of this year. So we should be before both the committee and the full council a few times, obviously over the coming few months as we continue to march down the council's evaluation of potential measures. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Chair Du Bois. Okay. I know. I'm sorry. There. It's a lot of information. So I'll look to uh, to you guys to how we want to break down this discussion. Um, rather than each of us try to talk through the entire thing, maybe we should break it up into pieces. And Chair Du Bois, um, also might I suggest uh, one piece is the polling. Another piece is the stakeholder engagement. Another piece is gonna be the actual characteristics. So those first two will hopefully inform that third one. And then just as a reminder, we will wanna to go to the public. Yeah, and so again, the, the recommendation, um, we need to receive, receive the info. Um, I don't know if we have questions on the polling, maybe we could start there and then provide feedback on ballot language. Maybe we talk about the gas one first and then go to the business with tax. Um, and then I really think we start to get into some details on parameters around the business tax. Yeah, so why don't we why don't we go to the public, and then we'll come back and talk about the polling and the community engagement. So, if there are any members of the public that would like to comment on this item, uh, please raise your hand. So, our first speaker is. Uh, Former Vice Mayor Greg Schmidt. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Tonight you're discussing the specifics of a business tax in Palo Alto. Why is this important now? The recently approved Plan Bay area is based on the assumption of a rapid growth in both jobs and housing in already jobs-rich areas. Palo Alto and surrounding communities are the prime target of that growth. The plan estimated that it will take $1.5 billion in public funding to meet future needs for just housing and transportation needs. Palo Alto already has one of the highest ratios of jobs to employed residents in the country. We currently have three jobs for every employed residents, similar to such central cities as Manhattan, Washington DC, and San Francisco. Yet who in Palo Alto pays for local infrastructure and affordable housing? Local residents currently pay for about three times as much as local businesses. Local costs are paid primarily through property taxes, sales taxes, and fees. Affordable housing costs also come through inclusionary zoning which raises the price of market rate housing units and increases the very high rate of income inequality. Also, zoning concessions increase density. Note the long-term impact of density. The three cities with the highest rates in the country, Manhattan County, Washington DC and San Francisco, have the lowest share of their population between the ages of five and 17. 
These are just a few of the critical issues needed for an open public discussion on fair share of a local business tax in producing a healthy, balanced community. Not just focus on business concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg. First, I want to thank uh, Mr. Schmidt for what he said, and I agree with everything. And it actually sets a great foundation for what I'm now going to say. Um, Palo Alto, the business, it is a bit absurd that this conversation, um, that all of the money spent on polling so far has been based on a tax that is first of its kind, and which, despite what uh, Molly Stump will say, um, has not been tested by the courts and is almost certainly unconstitutional. Um, while in its presentation, the city of Palo Alto cites East Palo Alto as a comparison for its tax, East Palo Alto's tax is completely different than the one proposed. Let's be very clear what tax you're talking about here. This current tax is a tax against tenants, against tenants, businesses that operate, that, that exist in offices that are almost always owned by someone else. East Palo Alto's tax was a tax, is a tax against the landlord. This is a tax against the tenant. Do you understand the difference? There is no, there is no tax or IRS scenario anywhere like this. There has been no tax proposed based on how much money a business spends on rent. The reason that East Palo Alto's tax, square footage tax, is, is written the way it is, was to make sure that Amazon pays for most of the taxes, which Amazon does. East Palo Alto's square footage tax taxes landlords, taxes business owners, it is a parcel tax, a parcel tax. And that Amazon, because it owns most of the businesses, most of the buildings in which its offices exist, it pays the lion's share of the tax. This tax was written to tax Amazon. Yet when the tax was proposed, Amazon did not object. Similarly, in Google, you know, in Mountain View, the Google tax, their large business tax, is based on headcount and with the tax not really stepping in until a business has more than 5,000 employees. That tax was written to tax Google. Google pays the, the lion's share of those taxes and Google did not object. In Mountain View, Mountain View's progressive tax designed to tax Google was passed by 80% of the voters. In East Palo Alto, it was passed by 70%. You don't need these polls if you just use an already proven constitutional tax like East Palo Alto and Mountain View. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron James. Good evening. Um, City Attorney Molly Stump, I'm making a Public Records Act request for the total cost of all the polling that has yet so far been conducted in reference to uh, this business tax matter. And I see that on the April 4th uh, consent calendar, there's more money being asked for polling. So Ms. Stump, again, you know that an oral Public Records Act request is totally appropriate. I want to know how much money has been spent in purchasing outside polling uh, uh, up and through what the, uh, what's on the consent calendar for additional costs. If we're gonna tax businesses, it needs to be the big businesses, not the small businesses, the high tech firms. I am much more likely to vote for a business tax if I'm assured that I'd like to see that reparation spent on low-income housing, part of the arena, uh, uh, 6,000 plus housing, and that the, in perpetuity, those houses be set aside for African-Americans, okay? 
a reparations, a large portion guaranteed, and no more monies for so-called public safety. We spent over $100 million now, plus, and we keep adding and adding for the, uh, the new prison. They call it the, you know, the police station, but we all know that's just a part of the prison industrial complex in this country. It's disgusting. No more money for those folks. We've been paying out for the, the police brutality cases. We've got a, 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 a city manager, uh, Mr. Chicago, that won't rein these, you know, un, these cops in, their budget, whatever they want, uh, he proposes, he pushes forward on. Uh, so please, that's, that's a very important consideration. No money for public safety uh, coming out of these taxes and a big chunk for reparations. Um, and I think, um, and, and, and again, when we talk about businesses, not our small businesses, we're running them out of town. The high tech businesses, like uh, Rebecca Eisenberg said, and Mr. Smith, you know, those folks are, have make millions and billions of dollars let them pay the taxes, they'll be happy. They can write the, the taxes off uh, as a business loss, right? They win either way. So let's do that. And, and again, whatever the city manager can do and the rest of the staff to break this stuff down uh, in lay terms. You know, take the time as necessary. You don't need to rush through it because folks are having a difficult time, at least I know I am, understanding the complexities. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Shweta Batnagar. Good evening. I'm Shweta Batnagar, Director of Government Affairs for Stanford University. Thank you for including the Stanford Research Park companies and Stanford Shopping Center businesses in your recent focus group session. From that session, it was made clear that businesses do not feel this is the right time for a business tax, and they are still navigating the impacts of COVID. Businesses are still facing some uncertainty with high inflation, supply chain issues, an unstable workforce, and possible new variants emerging. If there is a desire to move forward with the business tax, I would like to encourage the council to ensure the use of the funds has a well understood nexus to the business community. In addition, I encourage the council and staff to be reasonable in the amount charged so that Palo Alto remains competitive as a desired place for businesses to be when compare, compared to neighboring jurisdictions. The business community is already making substantial contributions to the fiscal health of Palo Alto. Specifically, the Stanford Research Park provides over $42 million in direct sales taxes that benefit the city, 22 million is funded to the Palo Alto Unified School District and 20 million in direct tax revenues to the city of Palo Alto that goes into your general fund uh, to use at your discretion. In addition, approximately 6 million in direct sales and transit occupancy taxes are generated from spending by Stanford Research Park employers, employees, and visitors, plus $3 million in utility users tax. From the Stanford Shopping Center, the city of Palo Alto receives over $6 million annually in sales tax and over 5 million in utilities. Adding a new tax to the mix increases the tax burden on local businesses. This will no doubt impact a company's decision to locate or stay in Palo Alto. Equally challenging for a business is the notion of an accelerating business tax into perpetuity for unspecified uses. At a rate of $2.40 a square foot annually, this would have significant impact on certain local businesses in the context of all other expenses of costs of doing business in Palo Alto and the Bay Area. The city should perform an economic analysis as other jurisdictions who have implemented a business tax have done to truly understand the impacts this tax could have on Palo Alto. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker is the phone caller with the last three digits of 002. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, this is Terry Holzimer. Uh, I just wanted to add my wholehearted support for a robust city business tax that is certainly long overdue in our city. 
Many of the issues that we face today in our city are a direct result of past council's support for uncontrolled levels of office development and growth in our city. It's long overdue that the business community pay its fair share for the impacts that they have produced here. Our increased traffic congestion, lack of parking in commercial zones, and other issues, including housing, are a direct result of the businesses who call Palo Alto home. It's not fair that taxpayers who live in our city pay far more per, per person for the city services than the businesses pay. That's not fair, and that needs to be corrected. Although I personally favor a head type tax, tax I do support, and I hope and I believe the community does support, any attempt by the city to bring businesses that profit by being in our city into accountability for the services that they use here on a daily basis. I hope you will unanimously recommend that the city moves forward on a business tax this year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Dan Kostenbotter. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, Dan Kostenbotter here. I'm uh, Vice President for Tax Policy, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Uh, I made a, a written submission, but I just want to uh, summarize that. Uh, related to the point uh, made uh, often that uh, unlike uh, many neighboring cities, Palo Alto does not have a business tax so it's, it's quite appropriate for Palo Alto uh, City Council to uh, adopt one or put one on the ballot. So first of all, you know, it's good to have businesses in the, in the city. They, they do pay and generate a lot of other tax revenue uh, besides the business tax. Uh, but uh, so, you know, the, the not having a business tax can be uh, helpful in uh, attracting and retaining uh, businesses into uh, city that's already expensive in which to do business. But more importantly, the city council is considering a business tax at levels that are far higher, far more onerous than most neighboring cities. And I listed the maximum or the, the capped amount that other, uh, that the large companies would pay in other cities, you know, from $500 in the city of Santa Clara under $6,000 in Redwood City, $8,000 in Menlo Park, under $14,000 in Sunnyvale. Uh, South San Francisco and San Jose are quite a bit higher. They're still well under $200,000. And in many cases, their largest employers are many times larger than the largest employer in Palo Alto. And I also noted that uh, Cupertino, although not having a, uh, a cap, they have a very low rate so that a 505,000 square feet, so that would mean half a million taxable square feet as Palo Alto's uh, thinking about it right now, uh, would, would pay less than $12,000 while even at the low end of the range being considered by the council, uh, a business in Palo Alto would, would pay 300,000 and at the high end of the range would pay well over a million dollars compared to uh, less than 12,000 in Cupertino. And particularly since the council uh, has been uh, talking about a forever tax with an annual escalator based on CPI, even a tax at the low end of the range uh, probably would be high enough in the, uh, in, to tip the scales for some businesses when deciding whether or not to move or stay in Palo Alto. So, my suggestion for the council would be to consider the, their proposal uh, so that it's more in line with neighboring cities instead of making Palo Alto the least welcoming city to business in all of Silicon Valley. And thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlie Widens. Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. The last two plus years have been extremely difficult for our entire business community and especially our small businesses. That is why this is the wrong time for a business license tax in Palo Alto. 
you are currently considering as much as $2.40 per square foot per year without an expiration date and an automatic cost escalator, meaning this tax will increase every year and never expire. We are hearing from our business members how difficult it is to make ends meet here in Palo Alto, and our business community simply can't afford a business tax of this magnitude. Our small businesses rely on office workers and others from the larger companies. A new business license tax can negatively affect our retention of business as well as, our, as, well as a reduction in attracting new businesses to fill all the vacancies we currently have, resulting in fewer customers to support the small business owner. Corporate travel to support their business. That adding this business license tax will force larger companies to make decisions that will ultimately affect all businesses here in Palo Alto. We heard on each of the focus group calls that we participated in that a business license tax would not just affect large corporate businesses, it will also affect all of the small businesses that support those companies and their workers. Our local small businesses who already have a tough time making ends meet at current tax rates would be devastated if big businesses leave. Small businesses simply can't afford another large tax increase after more than two years of a crippling pandemic meaning that they will inevitably have to pass this cost on to the consumer to stay in business. This is simply not the right time to add a business license tax here in Palo Alto. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker is Adisa Bitbedal. Thank you. Um, this is uh, Adisa Bitbedal. I'm the Chief uh, Public Policy Strategist for NAOP Silicon Valley. NAOP Silicon Valley, as a way of an introduction, is the um, uh, largest um, property owners, uh, commercial property owners in the area, and uh, really well known um, nationwide. So I'm representing uh, commercial property owners this evening. Um, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. And also I would like to thank uh, Mr. Sean Spano for the opportunity to speak at uh, one of the several um, outreach events that he had hosted. Um, I wanted to um, uh, let you know that uh, representing uh, commercial property owners, we are absolutely against tax increases at this point. Uh, some of the numbers that have been discussed since June of last year, since um, the finance committee has been meeting, have been very high and unreasonable. In fact, um, the no sunset and also the escalators um, are um, um, really will put businesses, um, uh, will definitely drive away businesses and cause a lot of issues for the city of Palo Alto. Another thing that we're really concerned about is the lack of accountability which means that there's no guarantee funding for homelessness and affordable housing. As commercial property owners, we do want to see the nexus of um, the taxes that we pay to the services provided and are needed in the community. And of course, um, affordable housing is number one on our agenda as well. However, how can we be certain that the money will be used as intended? Because this is gonna be uh, proposed as a general tax. And as a general tax, there's no legal guarantees that the money will be spent as promised. Um, and also there's no guarantee that the specific, even if it's in the ballot language, that the funding will be going to affordable housing. Um, we are also very concerned about that as well. Uh, with that, I just want to thank the previous speakers who have spoken against um, the tax. They uh, eloquently stated the reasons, which are the same ones as um, I have, so I don't want to repeat exactly what they stated, but we are um, uh, truly as commercial property owners. Um, we already pay millions in property taxes and 70% of the city's revenues from the utility tax is paid by businesses. This is going to um, truly cause a burden and uh, not only drive away businesses from your city, but add to the unfortunate reputation of not being a business friendly in the city. Just today, I had a meeting with a developer based out of another city, and he was telling me that Palo Alto is the one city that he will not invest in. And that's not the reputation that you want to continue. I want to again, thank you and staff for the work. Um, that's it for my comments. Have a wonderful evening. Okay, thank you. Let's come back to council. And um, let's start with any questions around the polling materials or community feedback. Uh, Eric. 
Thanks. I'm going to start with a couple of questions. Um, um, the gas transfer, uh, for some reason, I mean, I, I may be just in a fugue here. For some reason, I was thinking that was $4 million a year, but it's actually $7 million a year. The total transfer is about seven million a year. The piece that um, we have been reserving mm -hmm. um, for potential being at risk is a net of four. A net of four. So if we don't do the gas transfer, is the swing four million or seven million? If the council chose not to ask the voters to affirm the current practice, right. then the city's budget, including the reductions in services that the council has already taken, will continue. So if, the, if you recall, the council in FY 2022 yeah. adopted budget already took measures to balance, including service reductions associated okay. with a loss of $4 million annually in revenues. Maybe I'm not asking this the right way. So if nothing else changes, okay? Mm -hmm. Scenario A, we put the gas transfer on the ballot. Scenario B, we don't put the gas transfer on the ballot. What's the difference in annual revenue per year? Right. Four Thank or you, seven. Council member, I, I think we are not in a position to give you a precise answer to that this evening, as I understand it. And our our best people on the gas transfer and money are not at the table here tonight. It is a complicated question. My understanding is it also moves around quite a bit from year to year. I understand. And we, so we there saw are before, there are so many numbers that the staff average, is working on. Average. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that's what she said. Yeah. Somewhere between four and seven, <laughs> and 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 it and it's volatile and it changes year over year. Okay. So the best course of action would be to, to ask right? the voters to ratify the status quo of the whole transfer and resolve yeah, but, it. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, at some point we're going to get to the point of saying, well, should we do a, you know, should we do, you know, an X cent business tax plus the gas, gas transfer, or should we do an X plus Y cent business tax and delay the gas transfer thing. I mean, we're gonna have decisions like that we're thinking about here. So we sort of need to be able to. We'll, we'll need to bring then all of the <laughs> gas forecasting folks in to give you more precise numbers on that. Well, and Council You know, this is the reason that we have expected values, okay? I mean, yes, everything is variable, sure. okay? Right. And ultimately, Council Member Phil said one of the tenants, if we were to consider this placement on the ballot, yeah. is staff would recommend simplifying it. So it would be a complex setup if we were to only have the voters affirm a portion of the current practice, which is what I think you're trying to dissect through, is that there is, on average, a $7 million transfer annually. A portion of that is at risk and challenged. And so uh, if we were to put a ballot measure on uh, for voters affirmation, okay. we wouldn't want to create two structures. We would recommend that the council have the voters uh, affirm uh, one simplistic structure uh, that I, would mirror the current practice I and not impact rates. Okay, I understand. Okay, so and this so is the, the model that's yeah. been used by the other jurisdictions that right. we looked at that were successful with their voters is a straightforward so, ratification of the status quo. Got it. So it it really has to do with it really has to do with uncertainties in the outcomes of other things. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, 
Yeah. My other question is uh, is for FM3, which is I'm sort of trying to parse the, the interaction between the two measures. And so it looks to me that, that the polling evidence would suggest that if they go, both go on the ballot, there's a, there's a strong chance that uh, at least one of them would pass. And there's a strong chance that the, the gas transfer measure would pass. But if they both go on the ballot, does the business tax pass? And that one looked more like, you know, you're less certain, right? So I guess that's sort of my question is, if they both go on the ballot, does the polling evidence support that the business tax would pass? Um, as it stands right now, understanding uh, that the details of the measures have not been finalized in a way that we could present them to voters the same way they would appear on the ballot, uh -huh. Data from both the first and second polls suggest that both measures could pass if placed on the ballot simultaneously. Okay. Um, the support for the utility fund transfer when voters understand that it's a ratification of existing practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we tested with a potential increase in the tax and that was much less palatable for voters. If it's just a ratification of existing practice, voters seem inclined to support that in fairly large numbers. Right. The business license tax is more variable depending on the scope of the tax uh, who's exempted and who isn't, and obviously whether or not there is an active opposition campaign uh, waged against it, which my understanding is it's somewhat more likely for the business license tax than it would be for the utility fund transfer. All of those factors would play into whether the two measures could be uh, viable on the same ballot. Mm -hmm. But my, I think your, your characterization was correct. The utility fund could likely pass on its own or in association with the business license tax. The business license tax is more uh, uncertain depending on the parameters I just described. Right, because you know our 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 choice as a city is going to be sort of weighing some of these things, which is you know the the business tax. You know, fiscal impact is going to be significant higher, significantly higher than the gas transfer, right? And so we got to decide about sort of staging, and you know, you know, it's conceivable that we could do one this year and one in two years or not. Um, and so forth. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That was my question. Okay. Lydia, do you have any questions? Thank you. I wanted to ask a uh, city attorney. One of the commenters talked about constitutional and unconstitutional, how this measure is. Can you please help me understand how would it not be constitutional or, uh, or it is constitutional. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I'm going to ask Ben Fay, our outside legal counsel, to take this one. Ben. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, yes, it, it would be constitutional. I respectfully disagree with, with, with the commenter. Uh, the constitutional requirement for a business license tax is that it has to be proportional to, has to be measured in some way that reflects the amount of business occurring in the jurisdiction. And there's a myriad, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Um, a common one is gross receipts. Another way of doing it is payroll or number of employees. Um, there are cases affirming, uh, for example, a, a movie theater, and it was measured by the number of seats in the theater. Um, I've had cities that, for example, gravel mining by the number of uh, the, the volume of gravel excavated. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. Square footage is one that's out there. It was mentioned, I believe, by actually another caller that uh, Cupertino has one based on square footage. And so again, just has to have a reasonable relationship. And I think you could look and say, well, you know, in the same way the number of employees has some reflection on the number of amount of work happening, uh, the square footage does too. You could always point to, to circumstances where, where that may not be as perfectly proportional, but that's true for every measure. Gross receipts, you, know, you could have a business that has um, low gross receipts, but takes up a lot of space. So they're all, none of them are perfect, but each one, again, as long as it is measured in a way that has some reflection, and I, I believe that square footage does fall within that. Um, when uh, the commenter also said about, it's a tax that the landlords are playing and the ones that are tenant, does that have any relationship on whether it is constitutional or non unconstitutional? 
No, and I think that the caller was also mixing in. She pointed out actually that the East Palo Alto tax is a parcel tax, and that, that's a different kind. That's a property tax. It's a different issue. Um, here, it's paid by the business. Now, if the business owns the property, then it's also the landlord. If they're renting it, then it would be the renter. It's really it's whoever is operating the business, whether they're a tenant or a landlord, is really largely irrelevant to that question. Thank you. Thank you for clearing it for me. Um, that was. Um... That was important, thank you. Um, Mr. Fay, thank you. I wanted to ask on packet page 13, there was a, it says, I, I'm not understand what does cap units of measure mean? It's at the second line on the, from the top. Um, sorry. Apologies. Oh, it's about the CPI escalator with a 6% annual cap on the growth. Right. And this is actually what one of the public speakers alluded to. Um, some cities place a maximum tax amount as part of their tax structure. Um, so the speaker alluded to, and I believe you've also received written comment as well from the public saying that um, a city may have a tax rate or a tax structure, and it says that the tax will be assessed up to X dollar value. Um, and so that basically caps whatever the rate or tax would generate um, and the business wouldn't pay something beyond that. Okay, I see, thank you. Um, I think um, I think I have questions for Mr. Metz. And that has to do with when you ask the questions on climate action change um, on slide seven, on your slide seven, do you Elaborate a little bit more about what is involved in the climate action change, action plan, I'm sorry. Or is it just a big bucket? It's a big bucket. In the, for the purpose of this poll, we were really focused on describing the, the purpose without getting into the, the details. Okay, okay. And then uh, on your slide about the utility fund, So it says that this measure would not increase utility rates, but this measure, it's not so much whether the rates will increase because of cost and so forth. That's correct. correct. Okay. I have a little bit of concern about that, but I, um, I'll leave that for now. And then I wanted to ask, why was it important when you asked the questions, why is it important to find out whether um, um, Democrats or Republicans or independents and men or women and the age, what's the significance there for us to know? Yeah, there, there's two reasons. One is just to make sure that the sample of voters we interviewed is representative of the broader population of Palo Alto voters more generally. Um, we know that men and women, older and younger voters, Democrats, independents, Republicans view many of these issues in different ways. And to make sure this data accurately represents the city as a whole, we need to make sure all those subgroups are represented in their proper proportions among our survey sample. Um, the second factor is it also allows us in our analysis, and you saw a couple examples in the slide that I showed you, to highlight places where there are meaningful differences in opinion between different subgroups of local voters. Um, that's an important factor to consider both in assessing the viability of a measure, but also just for all of you to know and understand as you weigh uh, whether, whether and how to move forward. All right, thank you, that's helpful. I was kind of wondering, uh, does that matter? But I guess it does. Um, also, you know, in the past, I think in the first poll, or, or it kind of said that voters are pretty um, receptive to the 12 cents, right? Uh, tax. And so this time around, you went back with five cents 
10 cents, 15 and 20. Why not start at 10 and go to 20 and 30? How come, how was the five, 10, 15, 20 chosen? Yeah. Um, so in our previous poll, we actually tested the, um, the rates as percentages of the rent that people would pay per square foot rather than actual specific financial increments. And the direction from council was they wanted to test whether using the actual cents per square foot would yield a different result. So we tested it differently this time around to include the cents. Um, now the base case proposal that we tested at the beginning of the survey assumed a 12 cent per month per square foot rate for the business license tax. Our follow-up question tested a range of higher and lower rates going as low as five cents per square foot and as high as 20 cents per square foot. And as you can tell, that 12 cent figure we started with is pretty close to where the tipping point likely is with, with voters. Um, I do wanna also mention that the question where we isolated the rates um, perhaps understates how willing voters might be to support a tax at that rate in the context of a full ballot measure where they also understand where the money is going. The way I often talk about this in doing polling on tax ballot measures is, you know, a, a ballot measure is like a, it's a full meal where you've got some, a main course, you've got some vegetables, you've got some dessert, and the voter has to decide if they're going to eat the whole meal. They, they, that's their only choice, eat it all or eat nothing. In the poll, we have the ability to ask them how they feel about the vegetables and how they feel about the dessert separately. They may not like the vegetables as much as the dessert, but in reality, it all goes together. So when we have a question that isolates the rates and asks people how they feel about them, we know that's the least popular part of any tax measure is what you have to pay. And so voters may be uh, less inclined to say, yeah, I'd be, I'd be willing to support that tax rate than they will if you say, here's what you get for that tax rate. Um, and the initial question in the poll, as any fully developed ballot measure would, presents voters with those rates in that broader context. So you see the support is a little bit higher at the beginning of the poll. Uh, it's about 61% for a measure that includes a 12 cent per square foot rate. When we ask about the rates on their own, support for 12 cents is closer to 50%. The difference between those two, I think, has to do with the broader context in which uh, it's presented when we give voters the full ballot measure. Thank you for that. Um, um, when you question, when you presented the questions about what services this um, tax might go for and what people would see are as, as priorities, do they ask what would basic services be considered? I mean, what what is within basic services? Do do they ask that, or do you, does the polar give examples? Yeah, in the poll question, we we asked about whether voters would prioritize offering major new services such as affordable housing, climate change reduction efforts, uh, improving the safety of rail crossing, transportation services such as shuttles, or support for the unhoused. And then on the other side of the equation, we asked if they would prefer to improve the quality and reliability of core city services, such as fire and emergency services and parks and recreation. Oh, I see. So that's how you how you define the basic services into new and core. Oh. That's right. Now, of course, there's any number of judgments that are involved in what you mentioned and what you don't. You could word that question any number of ways, but those were the, the lists we provided to give them some sense of where the enhancements might come and, and where the investments in core services might fall. Thank you. And um, that's all for now. <clears throat> you actually asked one of my big questions. <laughs> um, let me come back to it. So uh, just continuing, uh, Mr. Metz. Uh, so looking at those these results, um, I'm curious like what your opinions would be in terms of how we optimize attacks. For example, you know, would you exempt hotels based on the feedback we saw here? Um, and what specified uses do you think we should emphasize? And, you know, what would you explore in a third survey? Again, knowing that those top positive messages of fair share, comparison to other cities, broadening our tax base, you know, with sales tax kind of declining over time. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a big question, but curious where you would go. 
Um, so let me just start out by caveating my remarks and saying I'm speaking purely from the perspective of public opinion. Um, obviously, all of you have to weigh some very important public policy considerations that the average voter doesn't understand, appreciate, and it'd be very hard to, you know, give them the ability to weigh them all the way that you all can in, in your position. Um, so speaking purely through the limited lens of public opinion, um, an exemption for hotels, I think, uh, uh, you know, voters have an instinctive negative reaction to it. Um, my suspicion is what they're thinking is this is a tax that will ultimately be paid by the customers of hotels who by definition are people who don't live in Palo Alto. Um, and visitors come and, and you know, they're part of the growth that the city has had in terms of jobs and its economy, they bring traffic. And so many voters are saying, well, no, those businesses should have to pay because it's a way of passing that tax on to visitors. That's a supposition. It's not something I have firm data to point to. But certainly when we have tested transient occupancy tax increases for you in the past, those dynamics have been what have driven voters' willingness to support those taxes. I think it is fair to say that most voters answering this question are not thinking about transient occupancy taxes and other hotels, or other taxes that hotels pay and that voters themselves have authorized increases in in, in recent years. Um, so I think a lot of uh, you know, the discussion around how voters would react to the exemption of hotels, you know, would fit into sort of what, how much of that debate they, they would likely hear. Um, I think it's very clear that they want to exempt small businesses. We only gave them the option of 5,000 square feet as the cutoff point. Um, but I think their instinct there is, you know, what, what they would like to see is larger businesses paying more and, and not necessarily smaller ones. So that's an area where I think public sentiment is, uh, is pretty strong. On the um, different categories for investment, uh, what I would say is that across both polls, because we asked different variations of these questions in previous ones, um, the things that stand out as being the highest priorities for additional investment are uh, housing services, whether it is funding affordable housing or providing services to unhoused residents of the city. Um, that's clearly a very high priority for local residents. Did you see a difference there? I mean, I know your survey was more statistically sound. The online survey seemed to show like homelessness might have been higher than affordable housing. I don't know if you got a sense of that. Um, they were pretty close in this survey, but a lot has to do with how questions are, are worded and how exactly the two are described. I would say in every survey we've done in the city and in the region, those two issues are close to one another as public priorities. Uh, my recollection from our survey at the beginning of the year was that the cost of housing was, was uh, they, were, they were both high on the list, but the cost of housing was higher, as I recall. Um, at the same time, I think there is both issues are ones that, that are high priorities for voters. Uh, addressing climate change is another, um, whether that's expressed as the risk of wildfires. Increasingly, Californians are aware of the drought conditions that we are uh, facing. Um, and uh, in Palo Alto, they recognize that these are both uh, results of, of a changing climate. Um, so the Climate Action Plan, which, you know, to the council members' uh, point before, is still uh, is a fairly broad bucket to describe what actions the city might take. Voters nonetheless want to see uh, action taken on those issues. And then finally, the other thing is, is issues around public safety. Um, and that includes both uh, response to violence and property crime, but also uh, street safety um, and, uh, you know, making sure that Palo Alto's uh, people who walk and, and cycle and drive on Palo Alto streets are, are safe as well. Those tended to be the top categories for investments that uh, voters have pointed to over the course of the last couple of polls. So when you talk about street safety, you would lump the uh, grade separations into that? Uh, Yes, although that is, you know, as my understanding is that is an or order of magnitude higher in terms of the cost involved with uh, providing it relative to other uh, street and road safety improvements. So um, the degree to which voters would prioritize an investment of that magnitude versus a collection of smaller dollar investments that could be made, uh, that's harder to, to tease out. And in that third survey, would you see, again, exploring some of the positive messaging and in more detail. Yeah, what, what I would recommend for the third survey is if the council wishes to proceed with one or both measures, that it provide clear direction on what it thinks the uh, structure and content of those measures should be. Um, you know, uh, we can then work with the city attorney to develop 
what are appropriate ballot questions for both, and then have a survey which tests them in the final form of their language and their policy with pro and con messages that are germane to the structures that uh, council has settled on and test whether in that form they are viable. Okay. And then I wanna go back to what you just talked about with council member Ku. Again, it seemed like the very first question you started off with 12 cents, 61% support. And then again, when you got into later on in the survey asking the ranges, it, I just wondered how much do you think there was a grounding effect of the values, you know, starting with five and 10, they, they just start going negative as you go higher and higher. Like if you'd started with 15, would they have been different? <laughs> They, they would. And actually, for that reason, we asked it both ways. For half the sample, we started at five. For the other half of the sample, we started at 20. Okay. So what the data I showed you is the average of those two approaches, because there is a bias depending on where you start that sort of process of negotiation with voters in the survey. And I did notice you, you, you said what typical rates were. And um, for the office rates, it was like 710 to 850. I wondered, is that kind of current post COVID rates that we were using? I know in the past we've been over $9 a square foot. I'll defer to staff on that one. I believe they provided us with those numbers. We pulled those from our research from databases like CoStar. So no, current COVID rates basically. Um, I'm sure it's a blend obviously, um, but yeah, I'm sure it does have some impacts of COVID in there. Okay. Mr. Yeah. Chair. Yep. May I just clarify that a couple of things that you asked about are fully within council's control. So council is going to decide on the exemptions from the tax yep. and we'll also have input into the types of general government services that are listed on the ballot question. The messages for and against are really things that happen out in the world that the, once the thing is placed on the ballot, of course, the council is very hands off. So some council members may participate in ballot arguments for paid ballot arguments for but that's it then. So that, that's really created by the pollster to, to test how that's going to go in the world once the item is placed on the ballot, just to clarify. Yeah, I'm not sure what you're clarifying. I mean, uh, he was stating kind of what public opinion was, right? Right, yeah. yes. Okay, that's why I was interested in. So based on public opinion, you know, what, what did you think would be most likely to pass basically? I guess I'm clarifying that council doesn't make arguments, advocacy arguments once an item is placed on the ballot. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I think I was one of the ones last time saying I thought the one and a half percent of rent was too complicated a survey question. Now I understand kind of why you were doing it. And, um, you know, again, 10 or 20 cents starts to sound like a lot if you're talking about a, a $4 re retail location. Um, so I'm almost back, back to, to thinking maybe we should talk in terms of percentages, um, but we can talk about that more tonight. Um, and then the, was the online mailed survey, were those questions written by FM3 or were they totally done independently? Yeah. No, they, the online survey wasn't written. I think he's talking about oh. the stakeholder engagement. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So yeah, this it, it, stakeholder it, engagement online survey, not the formal online poll, but the online survey and the mail um, survey were written by staff after the um, poll was drafted so that we could uh, make sure that we were consistent in the messaging. Um, but ultimately, no, they weren't statistically. Yeah, I, it was questions. just it was interesting reading some of the answers. It seemed like, again, people people didn't think some of the questions were clear. And I do think if we do it again, if we can align them, even though they're very different, and again, uh, the FM3 has a statistical margin of error, and I think we need to be careful how we look at these two different data sets. Um, anyway, so that's kind of my the end of my questions too. Um, so I'd suggest maybe we move on to maybe a quick discussion on the gas gas fund tax. Just I think that might be quick. Any comments on that? Yeah. yeah. So I have a question on the slide with the bat with the language. Is that slide thirty nine, Councilman Vice Mayor Coop? 
Um, wait, let me find it first. <laughs> Oh, so it's on slide number 39, uh, initial draft ballot question. Draft ballot question. Yes. Okay. So as a reminder, there's going to be basically two documents that staff will ultimately bring forward for council's review and approval. Um, should the council choose to pursue placing or well, either the gas transfer affirmation or a business license tax on the ballot. The first of those two documents is going to be the official ballot question. Um, and that's what you're looking at on slide 39. I see. It's a 75 word question that's posed to the voters. There are certain requirements that of certain things that need to be within there. And I will defer to both Molly and Ben to tell you what those are. And then the second thing will be the full text of the measure, which will go in the voter information guide. Um, and that full text for the gas transfer is found in attachment E of the staff report. Because obviously that's more voluminous than a 75 word question. Okay, well, thank you for that explanation. Uh, the, on, the thing in the um, ballot question, um, the last, the second to last sentence annually until ended by voters. So how are they going to end it? I mean, end it so they would have to come up with the initiative, go out and get the signatures required, and then bring it to council. So, so that's how it's proposed to be drafted. Council could sunset it. And so that language indicates that there is no, no council established sunset that the measure will go on unless and until council puts a repeal measure on or the voters do that themselves. Um, council can, however, without changing the language, reduce or, or not collect the tax in any year that it wishes to make that decision. Ben, is there anything else on that? No, it, that, that, that's a correct summary. It's there because you're required to state the duration of the tax and if you don't have a specific duration, it's kind of complicated how to say it. So that sort of evolved as common language across the state to say until ended by the voters. In other words, the voters can say, but you're, you're correct in your, in your question, it would either be they'd have to circulate a, a petition or go to the council and say, we want to put that on the ballot. Because okay, it would seem rather a lot of work for voters to be doing such a thing. Um, so, okay. Um, and we don't know, how long we would need this for the tax, the utility it's been, transfer. It's been 70 years so far, right? Seriously? 70 years? So it's 1950, right? Although it has shrunk over time. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Going forward. Saying. And then the chair just mentioned that it has been since 1950s, right? So. 1950, sorry. Right? Okay. I don't remember the exact date, but uh, yes, many decades ago. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess, all right. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I'll just jump in, I guess. Um, yeah, I thought, I thought this language all made sense. I thought the 18% made sense. Um, so I guess the choice was either a percentage or a fixed amount, right? And uh, it just seemed like a percentage would give us more flexibility. Um, in terms of uses, you know, again, since this is just affirming a current practice, can we talk about the historic uses and current uses? So you do need to say that it is for general government use. And so you'll see that phrase in there and you can also provide more illustration of particular things that it has or that you intend for it to right. be used for. In, in 15 words or whatever we have left. It, correct. And you don't need to use all those 75 words. You can make it shorter yeah. if you wish. So again, I mean, it's just gone into the general fund. Do we do we even know, has it been used anything in particular or it just is? Well, and we do, we do know what these funds have been used for historically. They are general funds. And ultimately when the council has taken budget action, frankly, to prepare for the potential loss of these revenues, there are services that we've, um, the council has actually cut 
that should the voters affirm, we would be able to restore and reinvest in. So, so which um, ones would you point to? I would look back at what we've basically cut. So basic city services that we've reduced as a, associated with this have to do with our general city services, police, fire, library, um, community services are some of the main areas from a right. service so reduction. Every, everything we cut, you're just saying it's kind of a portion of it you could say came from this or? Well, and I think as part of the budget um, that comes as we move forward into May, um, we'll have some allocation or some ability to kind of see the impacts of both COVID as well as the loss of these the transfer revenues um, and potentially um, areas that we would be reinvesting to make sure we can frankly sustainably deliver services that the community expects today. And would we be able to put into this ballot question, I'm just looking at it again, that we would not be changing gas rates because of this? What, what we have drafted into the ordinance is that the transfer is a part of the cost of gas service. That has been the case in Palo Alto for many decades. And so we wish to be straightforward with voters that it is a part of right. the cost of providing services. So in that respect, it does become a component of the rates. But if, if they vote yes on this, we will not raise the rate, I guess. Could we be clear about that, that it would not increase additionally? Typically, Chair, I think that's part of the pro-con arguments that would go in the voter information. And so one of the pro arguments, and again, this goes back to what Mr. Metz was saying in terms of testing as we move forward in this process, one of the pro arguments obviously would be, you know, this maintains existing gas rates um, and would not cause or create an additional increase as a result of this specific well, um, transfer. The, the con argument that goes in the ballot statement is going to be you know, if you vote no on this, then there'll be a rate reduction, right? That's I mean, correct. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think that we should correct. try to hide from that one, right? Because nope. even if we did, you know, the other side would say it, right? Mm -hmm. Or the opponents would say it. So, I mean, right. so we should be, we should be not terribly weaselly about this. And I, for, I forget how we stack up on gas rates with PG&E. We are below PG&E, um, typically on gas rates. Um, so is that something else we can include in the pro? discussion. Sure, I, that's a very reasonable argument for a, a, a ballot argument in favor of. Basically, we yeah we don't have a profit motive. So we are, our rates have been lower, but this is. Yeah. Right, so we are not an investor owned utility. We do not siphon or uh, <laughs> let me be less judgmental. Um, there, we do not take a component of our receipts and, and pay investors. In fact, Palo Alto's pay themselves in you know a, a rich array of services that the community depends upon. And this yeah. would ratify that practice. But but I agree, we don't we need to be straightforward with voters. We don't want to promise no gas increases because of course as a, on a regular basis as costs of pro providing gas services increase, you may, in fact it's pr quite predictable that you will from time to time raise gas rates. Sure. Yeah, yeah. that's not what I was suggesting. Yeah. Just the, yeah. you really have to explain and differentiate the differences that to this particular um, mm, uh, measure is there is no increase. It does not increase gas rates, whereas gas rates separately for usage and so forth may increase due to the purchase of it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the overall uh, message there is that it the, this ratifies the status quo that that Palo Altans have been as a component of the cost of providing gas services have been providing some support to general fund services in the city, and this continues that at the at the established and longstanding practice the rate. Eric, did you have any other comments on this? Oh, just that. You know, I think this applies both to the business tax and the general tax, but I mean, by definition, if it goes in the general fund, it's used for general city priorities. And I mean, I, I think as always, we should be, you know, 
open about what we think those priorities are. And I assume that none of this stops us from talking about general city priorities and, you know, which is, is what we spend the general fund on. So, and, and that doesn't shackle us to necessarily requiring that X many dollars from the, from the, you know, from the proceeds go to this, this task and this action and why many dollars. to what we're funding with the general fund. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, you are you would be prohibited from if you were to allocate specifically in a but, binding but can't way. Say, can't say 2 million of this goes to affordable housing. That's correct. That's right. a special tax. That's a special That's a different tax. tax. But I mean, I think in the polls show it sort of all, I think all our instinct is what people care about is pretty much what the polls show, right? And, and, you know, and, so, and, um, so. How, how, do, how would an advisory work? So if it was a general tax, but we, we say we intend to spend it in this areas. I'm just starting to think again, it looks like we could do both of these measures at the same time. I think we should try to make them look a little distinct. So if, if the gas transfer was a general tax and we cited maybe some of the things on the second page that pulled, not as high, maybe we save some of those for the business tax so that we didn't say the same thing in both taxes, right? Um, could we do that? Yes, those are strategic decisions for council to make. That's correct. And I think ultimately uh, we will be having this conversation in much more detail as we move into April and May, as we look at, um, as the poll, I think, outlined in one of the questions for the, the business tax about something uh, new investments versus existing. And so I think it's relatively clear through um, the polling that the gas transfer affirming the existing practice of the gas transfer and those funds going towards our basic city services that they for decades have been funding um, is that nexus. And then for the business license tax, there's obviously a broader discussion, both of the cost of um, to do and deliver the services associated with the expectations of the community, but also things that are new, like investments in affordable housing or unhoused programs. And we all know our large CIP investments, such as great separation. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm also suggesting, again, we look, listen to public opinion and maybe it's not that clean of new and existing. Maybe, maybe we should just look at how things pulled and maybe like the things on the second page, which were parks and um, cleanliness of the downtown cores and, you know, improving the animal shelter. Maybe those things get put on the on more in the gas transfer. And maybe those are more of the existing services. Maybe it just works out that way. But I, I would just, uh, I just think we should be strategic in how we describe the advisory kind of uses. And, and again, it, aren't you asking us tonight for how how we would send that to council, what the suggestion would be or not? No. Staff is uh, outlining the components of a ballot measure um, to start the conversation, to get both the committee and ultimately the council familiar with the documents and the types of variables that we will ultimately need to decide on, but that's not necessary tonight. Okay. Well. I mean, it looks to me like, as intended, right, <clears throat> this process is kind of converging, you know, converging to a core here, right? And, you know, the, the principal variations, I think, you know, I think we're, we're in general alignment in the, in the structure of what a business tax would look like. We're in general alignment in what the gas transfer would look like. Uh, major pieces left to be decided are, you know, what's the scale of the business tax? Okay, it's probably more than five cents, probably less than twenty-five cents, right? So it's, you know, there's, you know, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna guess we're talking between ten and fifteen percent, although the the full council might, you know, have want to weigh in on that too, right? I, you know, I think that could be a longer discussion, but that's sort of, sort of ballpark. It seems to me like that's one of the major decisions left. <clears throat> and then the other major decision left is, should we go for both on the same ballot 
or should we push off one until 2024, right? And uh, I'm not sure whether we're looking for, whether you're looking for a recommendation from the finance committee on that or not. I think that's probably a whole council decision and we're gonna agonize over it, right? But, uh, but it seems to me that's, the, that's sort of the two major parameters. There is, there is one question I, I'm curious about though. I'm not sure exactly how to ask it, although, so, and, and you may or may not have it at your fingertips or it may be appropriate. I mean, the information may have to be disguised, right? Because of the parameters we work with, but the, somebody brought up the notion of a, of a cap on the, on a business tax. And I, I wonder, I'm sort of wondering, you know, let's say for the sake of argument, it was 10 cents. So one of the, one of the lines in your spreadsheet is, is 10 cents. And so a 10 cent per square foot uh, business tax would raise it, would raise around $20 million. I'm curious, you know, how concentrated is that? Is that going to be, yeah, but 15 of that million is from five, five taxpayers, right? Right. Sort of like, you know, how many people, how many distinct entities are we asking to pay more than a million dollars a year, or half a million dollars a year or something like that? So I'm, I, I, I don't know that I don't know that you have or we need an explicit answer to that right now, but I, but you know we ought to think through that and as one of the check and balances, make sure we're not sort of you know asking counting on two companies to two companies to pay for eighty percent of it or something like that. So, I mean, you do have table table two here, right? That has the number of companies by size. There's forty one that are over hundred thousand square feet. Oh, maybe maybe that is yeah. so. Packet page 11. So I think we're switching to the. Okay. Yep. So on, um, as the chair is noting, on packet page tw uh, 11 or staff report page 9, yeah. um, there are just the thresholds zero or, well, yeah, I guess 100 square feet to 5,000 square feet, um, all the way up to 100,000 plus square feet. And end of that last column or last row is about 41. Um, properties over 100 yeah so i'm curious how many are over 500,000 square feet or a million square feet because then you start talking about real money i don't know the individual breakdown i know we looked at it in greater detail in an earlier report with the council um i would need to go look that up thanks sorry to ask you for more Th sorry to always ask for more information but uh, i'd be curious how many are over half a million square feet so why don't we continue and move into the business tax discussion? Uh, so again, I think there are a bunch of open questions here. The uh, level of the tax, uh, any exceptions, thoughts on the next round of polling? I'll just, I'll jump in, maybe just give you guys something to react to. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I, I started off, uh, looking at some of that community feedback from the focus groups um, and, and, uh, and how we can get a little crisper on, again, what we were just talking about, how we're gonna use these funds for general fund. Um, and again, I, I, I don't know where this belongs, or it, but I do think we need to start to communicate more crisply um, these funding needs that we see. And I don't, I don't think we should shy away from the grade crossing one necessarily, even though it's a large number. I almost got the, the I don't know if that's what Dave Metz was saying, that it was so large, it was almost a negative. Um, but, you know, we have four grade steps. I think we were looking at 200, 250 million of crossing, right? So it's like a billion dollars there. I mean, there's a wide range, 600 million to a billion dollars. Um, affordable housing. Right, we're being asked for 3,000 below market rate units. Even if we look at just the 1,500, very low, and we used 500,000 a unit, which I think is low for construction costs, that's another $750 million need. Um, and then I, I don't know what, what is the total cost for a police officer or a fireman if you did total compensation plus equipment and everything? I mean, I'm guessing it's 500 to a million a year, probably. Per person? Uh, when you add in everything, yeah. I wanna say for a higher level sworn position, you're 
just the compensation. So that just the individual and their full benefit complement is probably somewhere around 250 to 300,000. Right. Entry but, level would be lower than that, obviously. But then and if then, you add in equipment and car and trucks, all that stuff. I'm not sure you could get up to a million per person. Maybe, maybe 500. But um, depending on the equipment, obviously well, there's different apparatus well, that these well, use. Well, whole budget for the uh, police department's 40 million or something like that. About 150 people there. Not all of them are sworn, of course, right? It's, but that doesn't include capital equipment, which I think you're rolling into this. Yeah, I guess my right? point so is- you're looking at 300,000 plus capital equipment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we have, we have these kind of infrastructure things, great crossings. Uh, affordable housing, and then we have this annual cost of, say, additional public safety people. Maybe that's, you know, if we hiring 10 people, maybe that's 5 million a year, um, but that's an every year kind of cost. Um, and so I think, I think very quickly we could show that the needs really dwarf the amount of potential financing from a business tax. Um, and so we really need to hone that and communicate, I guess, that those financial needs and then um, whatever level of tax we are, it's a partial solution. It's not, it's not gonna pay for grade separations. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was a, an interesting triangulation here because the FM3 polling was primarily, you know, Palo Alto residents at random. And then the focus group was kind of bimodal, one was, you know, one was sort of the business community, the other was, you know, the nonprofit community. And so I said, you, you sort of got three different perspectives triangulating there. I guess my takeaway from the, from the, the, the focus groups, which I thought was, uh, was helpful, right, is, you know, it, it's not really fair to ask, ask people, you know, do you want to pay more tax or not? So there was a certain, certain bucket of that. But I think my takeaway from that was, and, and, and I hope we do this, right? Is, is make sure you spend it wisely, <laughs> you know? And, you know, Ms. Batnagger talked about a nexus and I think, you know, what we do, we gotta make sure that it works for everybody, okay? And including the business community. And I think they have a lot of needs. And, you know, the last time we were in front of here, we had people asking for, you know, more maintenance and, and security on University Avenue and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. So I think it's incumbent on us to, you know, Make sure we're not going to waste it. Right? Yeah, I mean that's kind of what I, was I think trying it's what people to say. really want to know. Right. If we say the business tax will fund transportation, housing projects, public safety costs, um, I think I think there is a nexus there, and I think um, hopefully the business community will see that. I think you know it's going to benefit businesses that the city's attractive, good place to live. Um, so I just think we need to figure out a way that we can communicate that very crisply. Looks like you want to say something. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add to what you were saying, you know, um, kind of defining, you know, we have uh, older um, community centers, you know, that's another one of the items that were in the um, comments that came back. So if people are going to live, it's a nice place to live and work, then we want to make sure that these places are kept up. You know, Lucy Stearns is growing older and older, um, coverly the same way, and some of our parks, you know, so there's some public spaces that we need to kind of keep updated. So if that's another feature that is kind of um, highlighted in the polling, perhaps um, it can help people also understand that's, that's some of the things that we need. Then also for the business community, you know, I, I don't know how much uh, we can uh, also add in our economics development manager, you know, that, that would help the business community in attracting more businesses and somebody to work with. Um, so I, I wanna kind of highlight that as well. Um, can, can, can I ask a question there? Yeah. So what do you guys think about separating the gas transfer uses, maybe the things you talked about, community center, and then the business tax focus more on housing and um, transportation. You know, my instinct, my, my initial instinct, but, you know, look forward to discussion in more detail, right? But my initial instinct is, it sounds complicated, right? 
Well, think, you're going to have a description of the ballot, yeah, right? And if yeah. they both say exactly the same thing. No, I understand. <laughs> but there's, there's going to be, I mean, there's going to be a whole community dialogue around this. You know, it's going to be, you know, on social media, it's going to be in the newspapers. And, there's, and you know, I'm worried that um, we, we need to be careful how much, how much we try to Micro-engineer this is is the only concern about doing that, and so but I we'd have were, to see how I have to see how it works out. That we should talk about public safety and things that benefit business. Well, I, I, yeah, yeah, I agree, but I think you're talking about sort of sort of implying we're going to spend the gas utility transfer on one set of things and the business well, tax on a different we, set of things. Yeah, right? If we said we're going to spend it on carbonly, I'm not sure the business community would see the tie. Right. Right. But with the user transfer. Well, that's my point. I think I residents think, would. They'd be yeah, like, okay, I'll pay. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. But, but, you know, that's what I'm saying is I think, you know, I understand the, the desire to do that. I worry about sort of the complexity of communication it takes to do that, right? And so I think that's just what we got to think through. That's all. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I can see how, how you want to... Well, I can see how defining it so that, you know, where one is more amenable to the, for businesses to um, support. Although I have to say, you know, I don't think no matter what, <laughs> businesses are gonna find it very hard to support a tax and other tax on them. So um, no matter what, I think that, uh, I think we have to just think that way. But I do agree that we have to differentiate, you know, what the user, uh, the gas utility, transfer is for why it's important and uh, what the business tax is going to do. So, I mean, I see your point. Um, I think I lost my train of thought, but okay. Um, oh, yes. Also, the other thing with polling is um, when Mr. Metz was talking about the climate um, action plan, he spoke about, you know, mostly to address things like white wildfires, emergencies, that sort of thing, and firefighters and that. But I think it, it, and it actually contains more than that, right? For the climate action plan, does that not also address some of the SCAP action goals? Yeah, I think we need to be careful about what would be paid for by enterprise funds, right? What would be general fund? So when we talk about the SCAP, I don't know what staff thinks, but a lot of the items seem like they may be enterprise fund related, like upgrading the grid, right? That's not really. That's that's true, um, committee members. And um, um, I think that's a, a good point. I do think to a certain extent, you're, you're starting to parse different types of general fund uses or um, really some of the refined purposes, which ultimately, I think in both cases, both measures, we're talking about general uh, taxes. So uh, it, while it really reflects the wording of the measure, I ultimately don't think it perhaps reflects the restrictions on the use of the funds. Um, I would like to suggest that, as you were mentioning earlier, Chair, uh, the question of what to take to the council and where uh, you might go tonight. Uh, there's a slide of uh, 43 it might be worth bringing back up the, some of the key questions that would be helpful for refining the work ahead and perhaps could focus the council's discussion uh, if uh, recommendations on these elements were uh, el yep. items that the council or committee wants to discuss this evening. So I, I was going to go through kind of my take on some of these things. Um, so you know, we get into the specifics about the tax. I think the staff report was talking about a, a short-term business. I thought a 90-day exemption was fine. I think we should include that. Um, there were some questions in the staff report without proposed answers, like uh, what is the definition of square footage? Um, so what? Well, my question was, what do other jur jurisdictions do? Um, would we just tax on everything in the lease, including shared space? So um, some of those questions that you're picking up on Chair Dubois, staff was just presenting as uh, our status of where we're at. Obviously we didn't bring forward a draft ballot 
um, question or full measure text for your consideration this evening associated with the business license tax. Um, I, so staff is looking at uh, the definition of a business, the definition of square footage, looking at comparable agencies, looking at our own business registry certificate program codes or, and the like, so that when we bring something forward, we'll have something for your reaction to. I will say the one area um, that should the committee have thoughts on based on the polling as well as the work ahead is um, if there's any necessarily feedback on the exemptions. Um, and so that would be grocery stores or supermarkets, as well as obviously the hotels. Um, hotels are pretty easy to define, but the grocery stores or supermarkets, there's obviously multiple ways one could define that. And so that is one area that uh, we did poll on, um, as well as um, through the focus groups, you know, discussions over our drugstores considered a supermarket? What if a portion of someone's square footage is associated with a supermarket? Does the supermarket have to have fresh produce or not um, if something is a full-time bakery? So anyway, not that the committee needs to do anything or take action on this tonight. However, to make clearer intentions um, on the definition of a grocery store would be helpful for staff as we go back and try and balance the myriad of potential definitions and therefore complex code. Well, and really reflecting where staff's time will be spent. Uh, yep. Should it be spent on, on defining a grocery store or other elements of the measures? Right. right. So, so again, on the, on the square footage, I, I think you guys should keep it as simple as you can yep. and not try to get into like taking out common space or shared space, it's almost like if they're paying for it in the lease, it should be taxed. Um, on the grocery stores, Again, under COVID, we saw, you know, like Target being able to be open because they sold food or maybe another store it wasn't. I, I think you had something in there about 75 to 80% of it was being used to sell food. I, I think some part definition like that would make a lot of sense. I mean, if it's really a, a bakery and they're selling baked goods, to me, that's okay. But I don't think we want restaurants to fall into the grocery definition, right? I, mean, I don't think we have a butcher or uh, in town, right? But if it was kind of a specialized grocery, I think that would be okay as a grocery. Well, I think that, you know, we, 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 may, we, 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 we may find ourselves trying to engineer corner cases on this too, right? I mean, it's, when you think of like, okay, you know, 20% of the effort for 80% of the good here, right? Is that, you know, things like a bakery, you know, or a 7-Eleven or something like that, you know they're going to be they're going to be either less than five. And assuming we keep the, the yeah, I think footage, it's like, they're either going to be less than five thousand square feet, or they're going to be so little over five thousand square feet that it really doesn't make much difference, right? It doesn't right. really cost very much. But I think staff is a trying super, to cut down on loopholes. No, I understand, right? Yeah. But but I mean, a supermarket is is like you know Safeway Midtown. Okay, it's a big thing, right? And so I I just wonder if how many people that run a bakery are really going to yeah. be trying to define themselves a grocery store in order to get the exemption? I bet it's a really small number. I bet between those two things, I bet we get most of the, most of the cases that we want. Well, would we be better off saying that we exempt <laughs> groceries that are over 25,000 square feet, like actually having a, a size so that we're not getting into maybe some of these smaller stores? Uh, and again, if, 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 if that, if, if we think that there's going to be a, a, a lot of 15,000 square foot businesses trying to define themselves as a grocery store, then, then maybe it's worthwhile. I bet, I just bet there aren't that many of those, right? Well, again, I think that the tricky thing is a restaurant would take out food. Like, no, what? grocery store. I mean, to my, in my mind, the argument for grocery stores is, you know, the, the city has such a checkered history, okay, with grocery stores, right? It's like, let's do something for grocery stores for a change, right? So. And I, I was surprised you said the definition of a hotel is, is easy because I immediately thought, well, where do short-term rentals fit? Are they going to apply for the exclusion? Um, the report said that you, the hotels you identified kind of matched up with their TOT. So we would use TOT as a metric for the identification of hotels. And remember, anything 5,000 square feet or less, assuming this structure remains, would yeah. be exempt. So if it was a room in someone's personal home or a you know 1,000 square foot ADU, that's 
less than 5,000 square feet. And so under that exemption would, to your point of how do you define a supermarket, you know, do we, is a bakery really gonna be more than 5,000 square feet or is that already gonna be taken care of as part of an exemption? So we, we, we passed to do this housing survey and then we have the business registry. So will we pick up short-term rentals through both of those? Great. In theory, the business registry certificate program, which staff would recommend if you were to exempt the first 5,000 square feet and only apply a tax on the you know, 5,000 square feet plus one, um, then we would concurrent to the business tax, continue the BRC program. We would make the administration of them obviously as smooth as possible so that, you know, check the box here, check the box there. Um, and so if someone was under 5,000 square feet, they would still be paying the business registry program admin fee, which is $50 per year. Right. I mean, I think that's a, that, that might, that might be a good filter too. I mean, the, the argument for the hotel exemption is that they're already paying sort of a pretty sizable TOT, right? Which in many ways is a business tax. So, I mean, it seems like the 5,000 feet, the 5,000 square feet is one, is one test. And are they paying TOT is another test. So if you got somebody that's 10,000 square feet, that's not paying TOT, that says they're a hotel, right? I wonder how many of those there are too. I would probably say that we would then look at it from a TOT audit perspective at that point. <laughs> so uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up was probably the biggest thing for me, you know, saying we're going to exempt small businesses, I think it's much easier to understand than we're exempting the first 5,000 square feet of all businesses, including very large businesses. And, um, so I'm still not convinced we should exempt it across the board, the first 5,000 square feet. And, um, you know, going back and looking at like option two versus option three, it was like a difference of 13 million in potential revenue. And so I guess I, I wanted to ask you, Kylie, like what is the challenge? Is there a challenge there if we were to charge for all square footage for businesses that are over 5,000 square feet? So this was a policy call that the council made. Um, and so ultimately it is a policy call at the end of the day. So the reason the council chose to stray away from option two and move towards option three is they didn't like the cliff that was felt if a business was 4,999 square feet versus a business that was 5,020 square feet. One would pay nothing, one would pay the full freight at 5,020 square feet. So when the council discussed this, they said, let's, I'd like to have a tiered rate structure so that it feels equitable across. And there, that would mean that the first 5,000 square feet for any business would be exempt. Now that's a policy call. If the council yep. chooses or the committee chooses to revisit that, I highly recommend the committee make that recommendation to the council for their consideration. Because right. um, current directions to staff is not So I went that. back and looked at the notes. We were kind of, the motion we made was kind of kind of continue to review the rates around option three, but it was kind of squishy, right? And so I guess the recommendation here that you guys came back with was basically still option three as, as it was back then, right? We just followed the direction of the council, which was to further refine the option three rates to do the exemptions for the hotels and the, um, the hotels and groceries. So it does not lock anybody into anything, obviously, but we just took the council's priority or preference for option three and further refined it based on the additional analysis asked for. Yeah, and no, I'm looking more at the little letter I around option three discussion. Can, can I ask a question? How yeah. did we come up, can you remind me, how did we come up with the 5,000 square feet to exempt? I think a long time ago. I mean, Kylie probably knows we looked at all the businesses and grouped them. Sure. So the committee chose the 5,000 uh, a bit ago. It was uh, an initial model and ultimately it was um, a clean breaking point, so to speak. Um, I found the chart that I think Councilmember Philseth was looking for 
It's in the January 18th Finance Committee packet. Um, if you want, I can share my screen, but it ultimately shows you the number of firms um, in incre smaller increments of square footage. Um, it doesn't reflect policy exemptions. So obviously I don't have the splicing of this by say a grocery store versus um, a hotel, um, but it does state if you were to look at that final 100,000 plus, 32 firms are between 100,000 and 200,000 and 13 firms are between 200,000 and 500,000. And of that, only two of those 13 are 500,000 or more. So I can- Any, Anybody bigger than 500,000? We, we just did 500,000 plus because it got down to two firms. So I'm, I'm not sure how many in total. So again, that is in the staff report from January 18th on packet page 21. So obviously from an options perspective, if the council chooses um, not to exempt the first 5,000 square feet, but only accept businesses that are at 5,000 square feet or less, then anyone with 5,001 square feet or greater would pay from zero to the full amount. Um, again, I should just share this. And that was like $13 million of potential revenue, right? So let me share, I'll share with you this. I think this will work. So would it be possible to put a chart together that would show council if we kept, if we did charge for the 5,000, initial 5,000 and what option three would be like? Charging from 5,000 and one square feet and up showing a chart about the difference in I believe that was done as part of the January report. Oh, that's so that's part of the January. So, so, am I, so am I reading this right? So at a 10 cents a square foot, which would be the dollar 20 column. Then, Correct. Then 100 to 5,000 square feet, we're looking at looks like about three quarters of a million dollars. 685 plus 65. Am I reading that right? Say that one more time. So if I look at uh, estimated annual tax revenues for the first two rows, which is 100 to 2,000 square feet and 2,001 to 5,000 square feet at a dollar 20 a year, that would be 600 or sorry, 685 plus 65, which is about roughly $750,000 a year. Is that, that that's what the, the 5,000 square foot exemption costs? No. Um... It would cost more than that because you would be taking off the first. The, the proposal right now is the first 5,000 square feet of all of these. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Right. So this is um, option one from back then, which is an exemption okay. for retail. Yeah. Um, and assumes the uh, less than 5,000 square feet in grocery stores. It doesn't include the hotels. Okay. So to council member Du Bois point, option if you don't exempt the first 5000 for all businesses right obviously that's the larger number that you're pulling down oops um in here your business is 5000 and 1 square feet to 500,000 plus square feet in option 3 all of them get they have a tax rate of zero for the first 5,000 square feet. Correct. What I believe council member Du Bois is saying is, so, is that they wouldn't have a, a tax rate of zero for so, the first 5,000. So, the, so, so, so he's taken, so you could take, I mean, there's other factors involved. Okay. So it's, this is not going to be exact, but you could take 28.6 and subtract 21 from it and say, yeah, maybe 7 million, which is the difference between what we've got on the table today, but that doesn't include the grocery stores and the hotels and stuff like that. So, but maximum it's $8 million or seven or something like that. Well, no, they had the cost for option two versus option three. It okay, was, then I figured out then. It was like $13 million difference. But again, we, the issue was that edge at 5,001, right? That we were trying to address. Right, and if you were on that last table, you can see that there are about 257 businesses between 5,001 and 10,000 square feet. So that's your core of businesses that you would be really, frankly, 
would probably feel the most associated with if you didn't tier the rates. I'm sorry, one more time. 257 businesses times $6,000 a year. Uh, maybe I'm doing that wrong. Each one gets 5,000. So yeah, each one gets a 5,000 square foot exemption. So the 5,000 square foot exemption at a dime a square foot is worth $6,000 a year. Okay. Uh, so 6,000. 257 times is one and a half million dollars a year. That seems low. So 257 businesses over 5,000 square feet. So if you gave each one a $6,000 per year discount for the first 5,000. Per year or per month? Per year. Because you get. So I will caution. You're starting to get to a more complex rate structure. And one of the principles the council provided staff and voted on, or you know, the sentiment was, is to keep it simple. So if you all of a sudden start saying, Correct. okay, well, the first five, anyone who's 5,000 square feet or less is exempt in full. If well, you're between 5,000 and 10,000 square feet, your first 5,000 are exempt and the rest will have a rate. Right. If you're between 10,000 square, you know, you, you start getting into a- uh, Right. That's, all, that's yeah. what we are saying though, right? That's what I think council member Philsef is just calculating. Well, how many businesses are over 5,000 square feet? Um, yep, I'm looking. Isn't that table two? It's about 800. So 800. Ish, I rounded. Roughly 800 businesses or over 5,000 square feet. Correct. And so the difference is uh, if you charged them for the first 5,000 square feet, you would get an extra $6,000 a year per each one, which is 10 cents a square foot times 5,000 square feet times 12, right? Which is 6,000. Okay. Right. So if you had 800 businesses times $6,000 a year, that would be $4.8 million. Is that, did it, am, I, am I doing that right? <laughs> I think that's about right. So I guess which, is, which is the same as, so the argument, it's, I mean, so the argument for the, for the avoiding the cliff is, you know, rather than 10 cents a square foot, but a cliff between, Forty nine ninety nine and five thousand and one. Okay, is just charge everybody. Just leave the leave the leave the the first five thousand exempt and charge everybody eleven cents instead of ten. Right. I mean that's to to keep the revenue equal. Right. Simply because the yeah. the cliff the the cliff has two problems. One is sort of the whole cliff thing. Right. And sort of you know the sort of perverse incentives and to game the system. Right. Um, and the other is. You know, well, what if, I mean, I mean, real life, there's not a 5,000 square foot cliff. I mean, there's gonna be, you know, bakeries that are 6,000 square feet, right? And stuff like that, right? By exempting the first 5,000 and starting there, you sort of minimize the downside of getting it wrong, if that makes sense, right? Because even if somebody's 6,000 square feet, well, they're not paying very much. Yeah, okay? I, I mean, you're right. If you change the tax rate, right? You make it so you, you'd opt, given the choice, you'd opt for a slightly higher per square foot rate and a simpler structure, right? I mean, that's basically the trade off. But then you run into the, the real world issue of, well, are people willing to vote for, you know, what's the psychology around this? But, but I was also thinking about how do we describe this? So, it's nice to say we're exempting small businesses. That is the intent. Is, is it small actually business. worth saying we're exempting the first 5,000 square feet of all businesses, like when we do the polling and everything, because that's, that's in fact what we're doing. But the, I would, I think of it, and I don't know if you can communicate it this way or not, but how I think of it is the intention here is to exempt small businesses. And this is a, the simplest way to do it, right? right? Yeah, but maybe there's some positive opinion benefit to saying, you know, we're going to exempt the first 5,000 square feet of all businesses. So if you're a small business, you're exempted. 
If you're a large business, you get a break. You get a break. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Although if you're one of the two 500,000 square feet businesses, <laughs> yeah, it's probably not that big a deal. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to get to was the rate. Um, and there was also some discussion about timing, right? And so I think we've said, even if this passes in November, it's not going to go into effect January, 2023. It, so are we going to say, and maybe in that third round of polling, we should pull for the timing as well. And, and it can maybe counter some of this while we're coming out of COVID language. So if it passes in November, 2022, is it likely it would start January, 2024? Depending on how complicated it is, I would say January, 2024 is the likely start. Yep. So uh, I think that's really worth. But I reserve the right to yeah. delay that if it gets more difficult. But you know, Ben's been still on. I think that's really worth communicating in these focus groups and things that the vote is now, but the implementation and then we have. Yeah. Um, just to be clear, um, Sean did make the timeline of both the utility ta uh, utility transfer affirmation as well as the business license tax um, known to the focus group participants. Um, and even January 2024, um, the feedback was that that's still too soon. Um, and they are continuing to, you know, recover from the pandemic and the like. Right. Okay. Yeah, but at but, least, but, you know, I mean, let's be clear here. Okay. I mean, I actually think the coming out of COVID argument, it's a bit of a muddled argument because it applies primarily to, I mean, the, the biggest impact is on small consumer businesses, particularly things like restaurants, which are, you know, dependent on people moving around and, and especially in Palo Alto coming here from other, other cities and so forth, which we're exempting the majority of those through the exemptions, right? The reality is the tech companies did great, okay, during COVID, okay? They did better in COVID than they did before COVID, or at least some of them. So the coming, out of, the coming out of a COVID argument really doesn't apply to the sweet spot of where we're targeting this, okay? Which is sort of large uh, enterprise, uh, enterprise corporations with global customers, okay? As opposed to local bookstores, Bell, Bell's Books, right, for example. So I, it seems to me kind of a, it's, I think we need to keep our eye on it, but we need to sort of be clear on it too, what we're talking about, because we don't mix apples and oranges on this. So, so kind of coupled with that, I was thinking, and again, we talked about this at the last council meeting too, we should, maybe we should start to talk about a phase in rate. So if we said, you know, this will be, this will be in effect January 1st, 2024, it would be at 12 cents the first year, 15 cents the second year, 20 cents the third year, and then CPI after that capped at a 6% max per year or something. I think we start to get to something specific. And um, I mean, I'm just throwing out those numbers, but you know, we've had so much discussion around, is it, is it 10 cents, is it 15 cents? Um, I think we should talk about like a phase in. Um, you're, saying, you're saying a larger number downstream yeah, so rather maybe maybe rather than CPI in year two, maybe we define a year one, two, and three rate, and then a CPI after that. We did something similar with the minimum wage. I think we specified the increases for like the first three years so that it didn't hit all at once, basically. <clears throat> well, I kind of think that you know, again, this is the CPI issue, I think is a little bit of a muddled argument too, because, you know, it, it, if, the, if the tax goes up by CPI, you gotta remember we're talking about businesses here too, and most businesses, their revenue is gonna go up, you know, extraneous of everything else. Their revenues are, are gonna go up at, at CPI as well, right, as, as do their expenses, right? I mean, which is why businesses are a good inflation hedge in general, right? So the CPI issue, I think, you know, the, the CP, the, if we follow the CPI, the tax increases without bound and bankrupts people. I, I, think that's, I think that's an unlikely argument because they're gonna scale as well with CPI. But I, do you see something wrong with a, maybe a, a cap at an upper limit of like 6% or something? 
I mean, I, per year, that'd be an annual increase. I think, I think it's unlikely we're going to hit a 6% cap anytime soon. Although, right. although when I was a kid, it was 18%. So, yeah. I mean, I could, again, I, I think it's a reasonable thing to cap an increase per year, just that it's hard to deal with as a business. I'm sorry, I said I think it's a reasonable thing to have an annual increase limit. What if, what if CPI goes to 12%, then what? Said it would cap at six for that year. <laughs> was so, that kind of what staff was suggesting in the report? So, sure. Um, understanding that CPI can be volatile, obviously, you saw the table in the staff report, um, and that uh, as someone who has to forecast things uh, as, for a living, some level of knowing my range of liability is helpful for planning. So, what staff would potentially recommend for the CPI is similar to what we've done with the stormwater or storm drain um, measure, which is it has an annual escalator on it. However, there is a cap associated with it. Um, ben can outline some nuances to that and some ways that we can structure it so that we can adjust that basically where there's a cap and ultimately council could choose to not increase it the full CPI Right. Obviously, as long as we're not increasing something beyond what the voters have approved, as long as it's lower than that, that's an option. And then there was another option, I believe, then that we could defer so we could amortize any major increase over a period of time. You, you could have an annual cap to so say there's a big say there's a big spike and 12 percent for one year and say you've capped it at 5 percent. Well, you would. Over time, that 12% is gonna drop back down. So you could say it can't go up more than that five or 6% cap, but you could play catch up in future years. And eventually, which does have the effect of, you know, avoiding any sudden jolts, uh, but businesses tend to adopt, adapt to those two over time as they raise their prices. And the last thing I, I had was in that third round of polling. Uh, again, I was a little concerned about the low, the negative impact of the hotels. I think it's worth including in the in the question maybe a comment about how we're already have one of the highest TOTs. Maybe a little bit of an explanation of the survey. Yeah. And I'll I'll ask Dave to help out here. Staff's intent through this next survey is to actually test the ballot language itself. So some designation on what the primary characteristics of the tax measure are, we are gonna have to nail down. Um, otherwise we'll, we'll just have another kind of iteration. Um, so, you know, acknowledge that once we get the results back that we can make adjustments but we do need to formidably form what the you know, position is that we're testing. Right, but we, would we test the, the, the pro statement as well? I mean, we would be testing pro con arguments on the ballot question, yes. But if we are still testing variables, in the ballot question, right. that's going to impact the testing of the pro con arguments of the ballot question itself. Yeah, no, I think we should we should be oh. nailing the variables. <laughs> so, so that's why I think, as the as city manager Shikata said, as we move back to slide forty three, kind of deciding and providing some recommendation, either as a committee or or deciding to have the council take this up in full. Um, on do we exempt the first 5,000 square feet for everyone or only the first 5,000 square feet businesses? So that's option you know, one, two versus three from January. And exemptions to your point, um, Chair Du Bois, do we include hotels as an exemption? Do we recommend that, yes or no? Obviously these are recommendations or preferences or priorities prioritizing things for council's consideration to help guide their discussion as they wrestle with yep. you know the ultimate so decision let me, let me try to make a motion i just emailed something to vin uh, if you can pull it up uh, 
So I, I just sent you an email maybe with a different motion. You know, if we need to accept the results of the poll, we can. I, I drop that. <laughs> This is kind of a shorthand. When I say require amount of use, I'm talking about a percentage of the store. Do we have a lot of these seasonal businesses that's less than 90 days? I think staff was concerned that it was in the report that if it's a pop-up business, they shouldn't. But the ones that they mention are concerts, performances, circuses. Right, so they wouldn't have to pay a business tax. So Chair Du Bois, just one as, as he's preparing that one note on little of five there. The the basis of the tax that councils talked about is um, the the space that the business uses to operate. It's not the same as space that someone might own. If it's vacant, it won't be subject to tax. Okay. So it's really it's occupied square footage. It's that's the the measure that the council has chosen to assess the amount of business activity. So what do, you, what do you do with common space or shared space? Is that, I was trying to capture that. Right. I think if you let uh, staff go through following, you know, other ordinances and the like, we don't, as long as you're simply yeah. confirming that it's a square footage business license tax, we'll use those two yeah. determining I mean, factors. We could delete five there. I just thought, um, what I was trying to get was, I think it's going to be really hard to like carve out, well, this is a shared space and so nobody's paying tax on it kind of thing. So. Understood. So perhaps to deal with that, we not the shared space, space side, but the square footage side under B, we could say a business tax based on square footage. Yeah. I thought we were already there. <laughs> um, Sir, are you are you getting rid of the 5,000 5, square foot exemption? No, I, I left it after the discussion. It's kind of as proposed. Uh, the first 5,000 would be ex exempted. We should add that. Yeah, you might consider adding that under B little four. Uh, require BRC and exempt first 5,000 square feet. So again, uh, happy to discuss and modify this, but is this kind of what staff is looking for? Did you want specifics on the third round of polling? Um, I would say just uh, recommend staff to accept the third round of polling based on the draft. I might say third round of polling based on. Um, based on our feedback tonight? Yeah. Based on, instead of draft ballot language and refined tax calculations, I would just say based on finance committee and city council's feedback on um, measure characteristics. Yeah, based on B. <laughs> well, be, also I think based on the discussion today, right? Yeah. Just so I think, yeah. So then I think right where your cursor is, you just say based on finance committee feedback and council, I guess. On the CPI cap, did you want to include the concept of 
banking overages for for future years. On what? Um, B five. In other words, you could cap the increase in any given year to six percent, but note that prices generally rose at more than that level, and that amount could be added on in a later year when the increase is below six percent. So you smooth it out, but you ultimately keep pace with increasing costs over time. Is that? I thought I thought it would just kind of catch up over time. But without banking it. Or... Not if you don't provide for that. I mean, if costs go up 10% in a year and we only go up six, yep. then we lose that 4% every yep. year thereafter. Uh, I, I don't know, does, does that recommend what you guys recommend? Well, it's a policy decision about whether you want the, the tax yep. receipts to keep, keep pace generally with increases. Uh, in, in the city's costs for the services it's providing, as well as in, um, you know, in the in costs in the general economy. I say added in and then um, as a recommendation to council, and if council doesn't feel yeah. that's something that then they can decide at that time. Um, and I think- um, So what would the language there be? Capped at 6% per annum. Mr. Faye or Molly? Uh, I actually wonder if Ben, Ben, do you with, have a With suggestion? a catch up provision. With the annual carryover. With it, yeah, that sounds good. With a catch up or with a catch up provision or with um, excess carrying over to further years. Okay, so um, then under B5 per, an, per annum with. Uh, with excess. CPI carrying over to further years. Wait, carrying over what? To future years. To future years. Yeah. The idea being that you'd you'd have that excess amount and you could then apply it in future years, but never more than six percent per year. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you. And that should be fifteen cents and twenty cents. And just to confirm, this uh, these rates versus the polling results on slide 19. Just wanna make sure the committee acknowledges or is aware of kind of where that break point was. I'm sorry, say that again. Um, on slide, the polling results on slide 19, which talked about the different cents um, and the voter sentiment towards them. This motion currently goes up to 20 cents. Yeah, so again, I think we had that whole discussion about grounding responses and how the questions were asked. Yep, nope, so. understood. Just wanted to make sure folks were aware. Yeah. Um, Chair, based on your earlier discussion, would you like to specify the years, as in 2024 as year one? Um, yeah, we can do that. So starting in starting in 2024 at. Yeah, so for V. Uh, so uh, that's little the v, v, little then. five. V, little V, V five. Nope, nope, nope. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, uh, the line right above it, starting there. Uh, after the word starting. Okay. In 2024. Fits. And then I think after um, item number C, after council, is that council direction or? It should be finance and council and council feedback. So. I, I, I may vote for this tonight, but I'm kind of uncomfortable at this point. I, I haven't, I haven't got around to being comfortable. Let me put it that way, with uh, especially the twenty cents a year, right? I think. Uh, I mean, it would have to be changing it. Actually, yeah. it's just uh... okay for two reasons, right? I mean, one is, you know, I think, I mean, twenty cents a year is is forty million dollars a year, okay? 
I mean, I kind of think we ought to go back. I, I kind of think if we're going to add another 20 million on this, we ought to go back to the voters for that. Uh, and the second is, if we're going to put the gas transfer thing on the same ballot, I'm worried that, you know, if we ask for too much on the business tax, then we'll get the gas transfer, but not the business tax. And I think, you know, I think that's a, uh, I think we want to, we want to, we want those to be separate, but they may not be separate. And so, so uh, I worry, it, I worry about that. Take it as a X, Y, Z. I, I think, I think whatever level we set on, we should ramp up over time. Um, so if it's two cents, four cents, six cents, whatever, whatever it is, right? So I'll second it. But I think, I, I think that that that's fair, right? But I think we ought to be looking at, you know, what the terminal value is here, not the not the teaser value. If that makes sense. So this question is: Do we pass it like this and send it to council? I'm sure that will be a big focus in this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's why I might vote for it because the, the real discussion would be. And there think, would be more discussion at council. I think regardless of the vote, we should, this will be an action item, right? So. It will be an action item. That's yeah. correct. Be One uh, suggestion under B five, if the if it's the committee's pleasure, is you could amend it to say um, a preference for a phased rate, e.g., three years starting in twenty twenty four. So it's as an example. Um, with the preference is that we would do a phase. I'm not sure if that is the yeah. preference of the committee. But. I actually think it's good to have some specifics to let council react to. Again, we, yeah, like no, you said, we, totally need to, we need to start to nail down these things, we do. right? We do. So no, that's totally fine. And then do you also, also want to accept the um, polling results? Well, yeah, we can. It just... It's okay. They'll get forwarded. Okay. I appreciate the, the follow up on the details. Anything but I think else? You hit the, the major pieces that we were looking for. Perhaps just to clarify on the motion itself, where it says uh, Finance Committee to recommend that the council discuss or uh, yep. consider. Under, and again, under there it is. There you there go. Is. Under the grocery definition, again, this is, this isn't really meant to be limiting. So, if you guys think that having a minimum size is also a benefit, I think you should include that. Understood. Uh, yeah. So. so oh, did you I, I mean, I, I mean, I mean. Let me, well, let me ask on that one. Let's say we do something really simple. We say, if you're a grocery store, you're exempt. You're not a grocery store, you're not exempt. And then in practice, what we're going to get is somebody that comes in with, I don't know, Ernie's Liquors or something. Ernie's Liquors not around anymore. So I'll, pick, I'll use them as an example. Ernie's Liquors comes and says, wait a second, I don't want, what actually happens? Then it comes to the city and somebody makes a decision. Is that what happens? How, how does such a decision get made? Ben, this might be a time when you can help us understand how administrative rules will play into administration of the tax. Sure. You would you, you would pr presumably have the um, in the ordinance provide the ability to there always, there always are things like this that you haven't anticipated. So you would uh, have the ability to enact um, or, or adopt administrative interpretations, but it's best to have you know, those interpretations have to be within the terms of the ordinance as approved by it by the voters. And there's sort of a, a continuum here between if you leave it too far open, then you really actually, frankly, could get into litigation based on well, what, was, what did the voters really mean when they said groceries. And so I think it's, it's good to try to have, you know, then again, if you're too specific, then people will dance around the edges. And so having some kind of definition, try to, something that fits sort of the common sense idea of what is a grocery store. Um, again, devil's in the details, but that's why I think there was some logic in saying maybe a certain percentage of um, the, 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 the floor space or the sales are for foodstuffs, that would take care of the liquor store because you wouldn't include liquor as foodstuffs. Or it would, uh, you know, 
some store that happened to sell some food on the side, if that's you know ten percent, fifteen percent, I think that would take that wouldn't be included. So I think it's good to have some kind of guideline along there. Um, but I guess what I'm wondering is what's the operational mechanism by which a dispute is resolved? Okay, so what would happen is somebody would apply for an exemption to the city, and uh, I would recommend having in place a procedure whereby first they would uh, apply for an exemption and the at a, at a, at a uh, staff level, they would, they would review it and either say yes or no. And if they then, um, if staff said, no, you don't get the exemption and they didn't like that, they could request a hearing, provide evidence. Um, you'd build a record and ultimately have some sort of appeal, probably perhaps to city manager or something that would then nail down exactly a yes or no. Um, but you would have a chance to develop a record where they could really try to show, look, we really are a grocery store, here are the facts. Um, and then ultimately, if they still disagreed, that they'd, they'd have the ability to go to court and say they're a grocery store, and you know, the question would be whether they are or not. Got it. So the staff, the the the, the staff basically rolls up the city manager's decision, and then be above that, it's the courts. Yes, that would be, and, cool. and then Thank the guidelines would be, you know, sure. they'd want to be reasonable, of course, because that could. But, but it seems like. Council, I mean, the one that jumps out is Walgreens and CVS. They have like two rows of groceries and five or six rows of other stuff. And maybe council should just make a decision right up front. Yes, it would be helpful to know, does council intend for Walgreens and CVS for those types of stores to be exempt in whole or in part, or no. are those not grocery stores? Right. I, so, I vote no. So like it's to a percentage, right? They're probably 30% grocery. <laughs> Right. So, but the but but then the, the the implied question of that is, well, does Walgreens get exempted for two rows out of ten or something like that, right? And so, that that's a policy decision too, right? Yes. So, and you could make either rule on that. Right. So, so I vote no. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like you agree we should have some amount of use for food sales that for some threshold. And then you become a grocery. I think I think of all our adventures in grocery stores is really applying to Mickey's Market and Molly Stones and uh, you, you know like as opposed to Walgreens and CVS. Okay, so I think we've been here a long time. Uh, I think Councilmember Ku seconded it. Right, I did second it, but I think there's already enough discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, should we go ahead and vote? Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Q? Yes. Councilmember Felson? Yes. And I'll vote yes. Could, to the chair, can I ask, so what is the process moving forward? It, this is going to go to council. And then even after they have given feedback on the polling, the polling results will go back to council. It won't come back to finance committee at that point. We're kind of out of time, right? Likely, yes. Okay. Um, we'll complete the polling in May. And then once that polling is done, just given the time frame, we will likely go back straight to council in June, early June, with a final ratification by the final meeting in June. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I think we concluded that item. Um, anything on future agendas? Um, the April 5th meeting is canceled and our next scheduled meeting is April 19th with uh, the bulk of the utility rates and then May the first meeting in May um, the date is escaping me give me two seconds um, the first meeting in May May 3rd um, currently we are scheduled for our normal scheduled finance committee meeting where we will look at some fee schedules. Um, those fee schedules have been going through other committees and commissions like PRC. Um, and so once staff's done finishing those up, we'll bring those in, in early May. And then we're on schedule for the budget meetings. Correct. We are on schedule for the budget meetings on May 10th and 11th. Hopefully you have all those holds on your calendars um, for full day meetings from nine to five or so. Um, and then with a wrap-up meeting scheduled on May 24th. Great. Okay. Okay. With that, uh, I think we're meeting adjourned. Great. Thank you. Thank you, guys.